All right, live stream people, if you can hear me, can I get some emojis from you as well? We're going to start in about four minutes. All right, welcome guys. Emojis, if you can hear me. Emojis, everybody. Awesome. Hearing well. Okay, awesome. Good news from the live stream. Yep, today's session should be pretty packed, so try and find a seat um, that's far away from other people. Welcome everybody. Um, we're gonna give it one, yeah, one to two more minutes. We're still seeing a lot of people come in. All right. So yeah, right now just try and find a seat. Uh, live streaming people, we're gonna get started soon. Um, we have a few instructors that are monitoring the chat. If you have any questions, just drop your questions there and they'll be able to answer them throughout today's session. Everyone's hearing me all right, right? Can I get some emojis? Emojis? Okay, sweet. Just want to make sure. Awesome. Are people still hearing me okay? Emojis? We have a few rooms up, so I want to make sure both rooms are hearing me. Okay, awesome. All right, looks like both rooms are hearing me fine. Okay, I think we're good to go. Let's see. Yep. All right, let's check live stream. Let's see, is everybody good there? Okay, so I think we're gonna get started. Let's get last round of emojis. Last round, emojis, guys. Emojis for live stream as well. Live stream people wanna make sure you guys are hearing me. All right, so I do wanna mention that um, we do have multiple rooms going on in alt space. Um, so if you re-enter the world, you might get matched into a different room. So I recommend if you are in alt space, try and find a seat that you're comfortable with staying the full session uh, today, just because we don't want you moving around uh, or re-entering and then being matched into another room. Uh, today is a very jam-packed session, so it's going to go two hours. Of course, you know if you have something that you have to leave for, you can. There will be a recording we distribute, um, but we're going to have limited time for questions. So we're going to have a breakout period afterwards where you can ask more questions to us, uh, but we're going to have to move pretty fast in order to get through everything we want to get through today. Okay. All right. So just to give a quick breakdown on how today is going to be uh, structured. So... Um, First thing we're going to cover is uh, the one, what the core structure is like. Um, so we're going to be pulling up my hologram guy again, and he's going to be talking about how learning in the metaverse works, it works and how our courses are structured and what you can expect uh, from each of our different courses. 
Um, after that, we're going to go into the content for today. So we're going to be talking about object-oriented programming, uh, which is the um, type of program language we use, C Sharp. So we're going to be talking about the principles of object-oriented programming and then doing some assessment based on that. And it's going to be a 3D lesson with the animations like you guys hopefully have seen from one of our workshops. After we cover object-oriented programming, we're going to be talking about 2D and 3D vector math, which is very important for uh, Unity development. So we'll be talking about how to calculate vectors, calculate their magnitudes um, in both two dimensions and three dimensions, and then we'll do some assessment on that as well. After that, we're going to be having two alumni come give a talk to you guys on navigating jobs in XR. So we're going to be having our alums, Adam Farouk, who's a senior technical uh, program manager at Walgreens, and also Justin Chow, who's a project manager at Bad VR, um, talk about how they went through our courses and then landed jobs in the XR industry. They'll talk about basically the kind of balance between building our portfolio and also networking within the XR space. So um, once we get through all that, that should really take us for the first two hours. We are going to have a breakout session like we have for our workshop after. And there you can come up and ask us individual questions. I'll talk more about kind of metaverse development um, and some of the concepts we weren't able to get to here. Um, but if you're on the live stream and you have questions today, drop them in the live chat. As I said, we have instructors monitoring that and answering any questions you guys have. If you're in alt space, we'll have only a few periods to um, ask questions to me with a raised hand during our session. And that again, that's because we have a ton to get through. But if you stay till the end, um, you'll be able to come up to ask me individual questions, ask our other instructor uh, questions as well. Um, and let me go ahead and introduce one of our instructors. Uh, his name is Jeffrey Miller or Chris or Chriso. Chriso, if you want to make sure you're on air. Oh, there he is. So this is one of our instructors for the Introduction to Unity course. He's actually our lead instructor. Um, he's currently a 3D pipeline engineer working with Nike. Um, and if you have questions today and you're in alt space, go ahead and send him a friend request, and then you'll be able to message him. Uh, also, if you're in the live stream, he'll be hel helping with questions there as well. We also have Tony and Chelsea who are also answering questions and across the different rooms. Um, but if you're in alt space, send him a friend request, you could direct message him. Um, but you do have to be friends with him first, just according to alt space's policy. Okay. All right. So yeah, he'll be over there. Um, yeah, I think that's good to go. Now, of course, um, as I mentioned, this session is being live streamed to YouTube, which also means it's recorded. Uh, and as always, we will be sending you an email with the recording from today's session. If you miss anything or want to review something, but in order to do that, we have to obviously know who's here. So if you want to get the recording from today, click on the sign up here button above, or if you're on the live stream, click on the link that's in the live chat and Tony's going to post that now. All right, so I'll give everyone a second to do that. Awesome. All right, everybody on the live stream looks like they're doing well. Good, okay, so yeah, Tony, Tony's posting the link now. Yeah, make sure to do that. I also wanna mention that we are going to be doing the raffle again. So if you attend our workshop, you know that we basically give away our instruction to Unity and C-Sharp programming course to one entry. Um, so we're going to be doing the raffle again for this class. So if you enter your email again, by clicking the link above or by clicking on the link in the live stream chat, uh, it's also in the video description. If you refresh your live stream, you'll be entered into the raffle and you will be eligible to receive the introduction unity and C sharp programming course for free. Now, the way our raffle works is you do have to stay till the end of today's session in order to be eligible to claim it. So we do call your name, but you're not actually here. I want to go to the next person. So you do have to stay till the end of the workshop in order to be eligible to receive the prize. Um, everyone's also going to get the recording and access into our Google Classroom where they'll see the first two weeks of material and learning materials. Um, and the recording from today, our course syllabus, a guide on choosing a computer for VR development. Um, so a bunch of free resources. Um, and the deadline for enrolling in the course, uh, most of you are probably coming from our workshop, is this Tuesday night. Um, so that's February 22nd at 11.59 p.m. Eastern in order to stay um, enrolled and get access to the rest of the 10-week content. Okay, um, everyone on the same page there? Emojis? Everybody hearing me clearly? Want to make sure? Let's see, are we uh, make sure we're not capped out in the alt space rooms? Do we need to open another room? Okay, great. All right, so um, with that said, hopefully everyone has signed up and has uh, put their information into the raffle. Um, Okay, cool. I want to do a quick icebreaker like we always do. We're going to see where everyone's tuning in from. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up an MRE here, uh, which some of you have seen again before from the workshop. Uh, let's go to... Okay, so it's going to ask where you are. Again, we're only using this to kind of do an icebreaker to see where everyone's tuning in from in the metaverse. 
Um, so you don't have to share that, but it's just to project onto this three dimensional globe. If you're on the live stream, drop where you're from in the live chat. Uh, There's just a cool thing to see where everyone's tuning in from. We are a digital classroom uh, you know, in the metaverse, so we can have students from all across the world, which is really cool. Okay, let's see where people are tuning in from. So we have, uh, <laughs> basically, this is always what we see, like a huge, a huge bunch of you in, in the United States. Um, so I don't even know if it's worth really going. A lot of people on the East Coast, uh, some of the cooler places are Hawaii, looks like. Uh, we have some people, uh, one in Egypt, uh, someone in Italy, UK. Uh, and then, yeah, people, some people in Vancouver, Los Angeles, a ton of people in New York City. I think that's the biggest conglomerate. Um, someone in Orlando, it looks like, or Jacksonville. Okay, very cool. Let's see. We have multiple people in Hawaii. There's always, like, some group of Hawaiian people who take our courses, which is very cool. Okay, let's see where people are tuning in from in the live stream. Uh, we got people from Florida, Arkansas, Wyoming, San Diego, Minneapolis, uh, New York, New Jersey, Sydney, Australia. Um, Kansas City, Staten Island, Pennsylvania. Okay, tons of people, Montreal. All right, so that's just a cool little icebreaker. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take off my little globe here. So one sec, there you go. All right, so now, all right, so I, I think I'm ready to go into the uh, basically holoport version of myself. Now, when I do start playing this, some of you have already seen this from the end of the workshop. It's kind of like a, an explainer and how the courses work and how they're structured. Um, so for some of you, this will be some review, but it's important to basically re refresh this kind of concept of how our courses work, because um, this is probably the first time you guys are actually be learning in the metaverse. We're, as far as we know, the only program that actually teaches VR development live in the metaverse itself. So uh, this kind of holoportation uh, lesson is going to go over how our courses are structured, what you can expect from each course and the content. Um, so Again, it should be just some review. It should take about 10 minutes to go through. So if you have watched it, just use it as a refresher. Uh, then after that, we're gonna go into the new content for today, which again is object-oriented programming, vector math, and having an alumni come give a talk about navigating XR opportunities. Uh, you'll also have a chance to go up and ask the alum questions as well afterwards. Okay, um, yeah, and for people in all space, when it does start playing, you might notice a freeze frame on your headset. Don't try and exit out of the app or exit out of the event. It's natural for that to happen. It should be about three to five seconds. And that's basically your headset loading in the animations for uh, the holoportation. So uh, don't exit out of the app, let it load and it should play fine. When it does start playing, throw up some emojis so I know that you guys are able to see it. Um, and I think we're ready to jump in. Can we get last round of emojis? Everybody's clear on what's gonna happen. Live stream people, this shouldn't be an issue at all. All right. Okay, so I think we're gonna get started. Uh, emojis when it does start playing. And let's go ahead and take a look. In three, two, one. Hello everyone, I'm back in my real life form. If you're able to hear and see me, if you could throw some emojis if you're in alt space or comment if you're on a live stream, that would be much appreciated. That way I know you're able to hear and see me okay. I'm gonna give everyone a little bit to do that. Okay, awesome. Now, if you're interested in taking next steps to building your own VR app, as I mentioned before, we offer a pipeline of four courses taking you from a complete beginner to building your own VR app. I'll go through how we teach VR development in VR for those that are interested in joining us. Now, all of our courses run as follows. One, we meet once a week live in VR to teach and assess you on what you've learned and built. During the week, you have videos you need to watch and assignments you need to do, and then during our weekend live classes, we go through what you learned and test you. Two, all of our sessions you can attend either live in VR or on your computer through Altspace VR or through our YouTube live stream, so you don't need a VR headset in order to attend our live meetups. All of our live classes are fully recorded and distributed to you in case you missed a class or want to review anything we went over. Three, during our live classes, we go through our self-produced database of over 80 3D experiences, which demonstrate and explain the 3D concepts you're learning. It makes sense to learn three-dimensional concepts, which is what Unity presents, in three dimensions. Four, we have two instructor-led open office hours each week to help you with any questions you have or any troubles you're having with your coursework. Five, you have access to our class Discord, 
where you can get immediate help at almost any hour of the day as long as us instructors are not asleep. Contrary to what our students think, we actually do have a bedtime. Six, you have the option to get weekly one-on-one -on -one hour long mentorship and support sessions from one of our instructors or experts. You can use this time to get help with your personal project or your course assignments. Seven, in total you can expect about six to eight hours of work per week. This course is meant to be a part-time commitment that you can succeed in while working a job or going to school. Eight, all of our courses are project-based. You are building a new Unity project every week that teaches you specific Unity concepts that you can then add to your portfolio of work. Nine, when you complete each of our courses, you get a certificate from us, Universe, and our courses also prepare you for the Unity User Programmer Certificate to get an industry-recognized certification. Ten, and lastly, but very importantly, we offer a unique policy where if you enroll in one of our courses once, it is free for you to take as many times as you like forever. So if you fall behind and can't complete the run you're currently in, or even if you just want to go back and review, you can take any future run of the course completely free, no questions asked. That is something that we offer that we haven't seen offered at other live programs. On that same note, all of our class material, including class recordings, assignments, our class discord, and more, will forever be available to you. Because of how our courses are set up, we've seen a four times higher completion rate than traditional online courses. And you can see why from our student responses. 87% of students said our course was significantly better or better than an online course. 85% of students said it was much easier or easier to stay motivated. And 90% of students said our 3D experiences were very helpful or helpful to their learning. Whenever you enroll in any of our courses, you get access to our universe community. You get access to our free universe workshops, where we've gone over blender modeling, how to make photospheres and 3D hemispheres, alumni interviews, and more. You also get access to our universe socials, where we explore VR apps and games together. As I mentioned before, relationship building is one of our best value propositions. Because of this, we put a lot of effort into connecting you with your peers to make friendships and professional connections. That relationship building is all made easier due to the fact that we hold our events and socials in Altspace VR, which unlike traditional video chat services like Zoom, allows you to interact like you would in real life in a 3D immersive environment. Now I'm gonna briefly go through our pipeline of courses. The first course in that pipeline is our Introduction to Unity and C Sharp programming course. That course assumes no previous programming or Unity experience and all levels are welcome. We've had complete beginners take that course and graduate as well as heads of technical innovation at Amazon's Audible or software engineers at IBM. All have found tremendous value because this course not only teaches c -sharp programming, but also the Unity engine and the Unity 3D programming library. This is a 10-week course starting February 19th and meeting once a week on Saturdays from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern. One of the best parts about this course is that it's only $199 for the entire course, which is 30 times less expensive than what you'll find through other live VR development course providers. I'll talk about a price breakdown and also give out a discount for the course after I briefly go over the other courses in our pipeline. The way our pipeline works is once you finish one course, around two weeks after you graduate, you'll start the next one. So after you graduate the Introduction to Unity and c -sharp Programming course, You'll start the next course, VR World and Advanced Unity Development, two weeks later. Once you graduate from that course, two weeks later you'll move on to VR App Development, and so on and so forth. In the VR World and Advanced Unity Development course, you build your first VR world like the one you see around you today. You also learn Unity Lighting, Animation, using third-party asset stores, Blender Decimation, and how to use Git and GitHub for your Unity projects. That is a nine-week live course that meets Sundays from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern and is $599 for the entire course. The next course is VR App Development, where you build and improve your VR app each week with a team of two to three fellow students. That is a 10-week live course that meets Sundays from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern and is $599 for the entire course as well. Lastly, we have our VR App Interactions and Publishing course. Here you learn how to program VR continuous movement, grab interactions, make photogrammetry models, and publish your team's VR app to the Oculus App Lab store. That is a nine-week live course that meets Sundays from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern and is $599 for the entire course. Now, all of our courses on average cost $499.
but if you look at the value you're getting, it's at least 10 times that. Here you can see our courses have a market value of $6,000 each and a full breakdown of what you're getting. Now you might ask, where am I getting these values from? Well, if you try and find an equivalent live VR development course using something like Zoom for meetings, the price will range between four to $12,000. We are charging $499 which is between eight to 24 times less expensive. The reason we're charging way below market value is because our business model is not to have a few students with a lot of disposable income take our courses. Our business model is to drastically lower the cost so that we can have a lot of more students who have a strong interest in becoming a VR developer. Now we also offer one-on-one -on -one mentoring packages to supplement our courses as well. This is for those students who want an individual expert guidance from one of our instructors to help them with their personal project or coursework. These occur during hour-long private meetings at a time during the week that works for you. Lastly, I want to show you all a short video going through the student projects we've seen throughout our courses so you can get a better sense of what you're going to be building with us. After that, we'll portal to a student-made VR world to take questions from you all and hang out. I'm going to jump into my VR avatar now, but I hope you've enjoyed experiencing the future of online learning and can join us learning in virtual reality.
Alright, emojis, guys. Emojis. Alright, I'll come back on stage here. Hello. Okay, awesome. Let me... Live stream people, are you able to hear me? I want to make sure everyone's able to hear me okay. Okay, so, yeah, that was basically a brief video going over the basics about our courses. Let me make sure all the rooms are good also. Um, and some of you guys have already seen that if you attended the workshops, uh, so that should be a bit of a refresher. Now we're going to move on into the object-oriented portion of today. So we're going to be talking about the principles of object-oriented programming uh, and then basically doing some assessment after we go through a quick lesson. Um, so I know there's probably a lot of questions. Uh, if you could keep them, either put them in the live stream or keep them until after because we do have a very tight schedule for today, uh, that'd be much appreciated. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into that. So let me set that up for everybody. Uh, we have a few rooms, so I got to move things around. Uh, one second. And everyone is going to gain access to our Google Classroom for the class, which goes more in depth onto what I mentioned with our course syllabus. Uh, so you'll not only get the recording from today, but you'll also get access into the Google Classroom. Um, and I would highly recommend checking out the syllabus, which goes through a week by week breakdown um, and also explains some of the stuff I talk about more in depth. All right, so I moved the quiz in one room. Let me move it for the people in the room that I'm in. So one second for those people. Uh, so for, yeah, here we go. And there we go here. Same thing should happen here. Once we start playing the animations, um, you again might notice a freeze frame. Again, do not exit out of the app. Uh, it just takes about three to five seconds for it to load. All right. And we're going to move this here. All right, so uh, let's check it out. Now, do you see on stage here? Let's go ahead and go to the next question. Let me move this a little bit up for everybody. Let's go. OK. So it should say object-oriented programming for one room, emojis if it does. And let me change it for the other room. Awesome. All right, so for the other room people, I'll go ahead and put it for you guys. All right, let's get some emojis. Does everyone see the word object-oriented programming up there? Fantastic. Okay, so yeah, we're going to do a quick lesson basically going over the principles. So this will just be kind of a learning component, and then we're going to do some assessment based on what you see in the animation, right? Um, so give me emojis when it starts playing. Um, we're going to do some questions after. Hopefully, you'll have some time for some Q&A from you guys. Again, we're monitoring the live stream for any questions there as well. And um, yeah, I think let's go ahead and get started. Um, emojis when the animation starts playing. All right, let's check it out in three, two, one. Before we get into object-oriented programming, let us talk about what came before, which was procedural programming. Procedural programming treats data and procedures as two different entities. Procedures, which are also known as routines or functions, are just a set of steps to be followed. For example, I could write a procedure or function for a user to attack an enemy. In this function, I would outline the steps of checking if the enemy is in range, and if so, then checking what weapon the user is using, and finally dealing damage to the enemy. In procedural programming, you would write your functions and have data, which the functions would then operate on and change. An example of data for our function we defined above would be the user and enemy position, weapon damage, and enemy health data. Procedural programming is very simple, but it lacks reusability as you will constantly be copying and pasting code from one function to use in another. This represents a problem because if you change the code to one function, you could break it where it is used elsewhere. For larger and more complex software, object-oriented programming is your best bet. Object-oriented programming is based on the concept of objects, which can contain data in the form of fields, also known as attributes or properties, and code in the form of procedures, also known as methods or functions. Most object-oriented programming languages are class-based. This presents a more realistic view of the world. To give you an example of object-oriented programming, say you are creating a program and need to generate enemies. In object-oriented programming, you define a class, which is a blueprint for creating enemies. You can use this class or blueprint to instantiate or create instances of that class. 
That way, you can create an unlimited number of enemies without having to define its functions and data each time. This is because you're using the same blueprint or class to create all of them. It's also similar to a recipe for baking a cake. You can have your recipe or a class and use it to create an unlimited number of cakes, all using the same recipe. The benefits of object-oriented programming is its reusability, security, and organization. There are four principles of object-oriented programming, encapsulation, polymorphism, abstraction, and inheritance. Let's start with encapsulation. Encapsulation deals with restricting access to the state of an object. You do that by listing the functions and variables of a class as private or public. If a function or variable is private, that means that you can only use that function or variable inside of the class, and it cannot be accessed outside of the class. On the other hand, if a function or variable is public, it can be accessed and used outside the class. So encapsulation dictates how a class is able to communicate its functions and variables. The next principle is inheritance, which is really important to the reusability of classes. Many classes you are going to define are going to be similar to one another. For example, say you need to define a dog and cat class. There are a lot of similarities between a dog and a cat. Both have similar data, such as number of legs, eyes, tails, noses, as well as similar functions, such as walk, jump, eat, sleep, etc. Rather than define a separate class for each one and write the same variables and functions for each, it is smarter to define a parent class called animal, which defines those similar variables and functions. Then define child classes that inherit those variables and functions and also define their own unique to them. For example, a cat would have the unique function meow and the dog would have the unique function bark. The next principle is polymorphism, which deals with the issue that can come from using inheritance. Say we have a method implemented in the parent class, animal, called walk, and we like to be able to use it in our child class, cat, as well. That is what polymorphism allows by allowing a child class to be used just like a parent class so there's no problem with mixing types. The last principle is abstraction. When using object-oriented programming, your programs can get to be large and complex. This can make it hard for you to interact with them and even harder for outsiders who aren't familiar with your program. This is where abstraction comes into play, as abstraction means you should only share essential variables and functions of an object and hide the rest. Say you are writing a program for a photo sharing app like Instagram. Instagram is an incredibly complex program with communicating with servers to store and retrieve photos, user information, comments, likes, etc. But you, as the user, have a simple interface to interact with the program, such as swiping and clicking buttons. That is the principle of abstraction, as you hide the complex details of a program and provide a simple interface to interact with it. All right, emojis, if you're able to see that, emojis. Awesome, laugh from your people, everything good? Okay, great, so we just covered some of the basic principles of object-oriented programming. Now we're gonna go over some questions assessing you, and each question is also gonna have an animation that's going to appear on stage. But don't worry if you get it wrong, we'll be going over the answers with animations. Uh, now, important note, for the people in alt space, it's simple, click on A or B based on what you think the answer is, I'll let you vote in a second. For the people on live stream, I'm going to go ahead and give you the link to uh, participate with us. So one second. I'm going to put it in both the live chat as well as the video description. Uh, so let's do. And when I do post a link, do not just directly click on it. You want to right click on it and open it in a new tab. All right. So don't directly click on it. If you do, you're going to be exited out of the uh, live stream, which we obviously don't want. Go ahead and refresh. If you're on the live stream, it's in the video description, or you can click on the link in the live chat. Either is fine. All right, so we're gonna wait for our live stream people. Again, click on the link. And let me go ahead and enable voting for our Altspace people. 
All right, so all space people, click on A or B based on what you think the answer is. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and reveal. And we'll do the same for our, for our live stream. We're waiting for them. Okay, looks like we got a decent chunk. Again, don't worry if you know the, don't know the answer to this. We're going to cover the answer in a second with an animation. So just go ahead and vote. Give us your best attempt, and we'll cover it in a second. Okay. All right. I think we should be go votes here. I'm going to go ahead and reveal in three, two, one. 98%. Yes. Yeah, so the answer is yes. C Sharp is an object oriented programming language. Let me reveal for the live stream people as well. All right. So we're going to go ahead and play animation. When it does start playing, give me some emojis so I know you see it. And let's check it out in three, two, one. The answer is true. It is an object oriented programming language. C Sharp is an object oriented programming language, which means that it uses things like classes, objects, methods, and variables as concepts. Object oriented programming languages follow four basic principles abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. We're going to be talking about encapsulation first, and then we'll go and talk about abstraction. These two are what I believe to be the most important to understand at the beginning. So let's start with encapsulation. Let's say we're building a mobile banking app and we wanted to find a class that allows the user to see his account information, make transfers, and pay bills. Encapsulation is a property of defining how a class communicates by listing these things as private or public. So for some things in a class, we want to make them public. For example, like its methods. Say the user wants to check their balance for their account. We make that a public method because the user should be able to see their remaining balance. Say the user wants to make a transfer, that should also be a public method, but there are certain things that should be private, which the user can't change by interacting with the class. These will be things like setting the amount of money a user has in their bank account. We don't want the user to be able to dictate what that is and have that functionality, as this would allow the user to input any amount of money into their bank account. Because of that, we want to set that method to a private method to restrict access only to those who have access to the class, like the bank itself. So you see the importance of encapsulation, of restricting access to certain data to make sure only the right people have access to the right methods and data. Awesome. Emojis when that finishes for everybody. Awesome. Okay, let's go to the next question. So why is abstraction useful for object-oriented programming? All right, I'm gonna go to the next question for live stream people as well. All right. I also wanna mention, yeah, today's session is recorded, so don't worry, we're gonna distribute, to that, distribute the recording to you guys afterwards in case you wanna review anything. All right, go ahead and answer. All right, I'm gonna reveal in three, two, one. Yep, so the answer is why is abstraction useful for object-oriented programming, hides the underlying complexity and provides a simple interface. Okay, so we're gonna go over the answer, so don't worry if you got it wrong in the animation that's coming up. I'm gonna go ahead and reveal for the live stream people as well. All right, give me emojis when it starts playing and let's go ahead and take a look in three, two, one. So there are many reasons why when programming, we use object oriented programming and define things like classes and objects. We'll go over one of the main benefits of object oriented programming and abstraction. Think of when you're using a complex technology like a phone or like a car, there is a lot going into building that specific device. There is a motor, the electronics, the networking, a whole bunch of different things. But you as the user, say for something like a phone, have a very simple interface to interact with a very complex system. You have buttons and touches to navigate and make use of the phone without having to understand the underlying complexities that lie underneath it. And that same principle applies with making classes and using objects in programming. You can create instances of a class and use those instances without having to understand 
how that class is programmed. And that is the concept of abstraction. You're abstracting away a lot of the complexities and providing a simple interface for someone to use. This is what classes and object-oriented programming accomplishes. So the concept of abstraction is providing a simple interface and hiding the complexities of a program. All right, emojis when that finishes. Awesome. Okay, let's go to next question. So what is, well, which is a template or blueprint from which objects can be instantiated from? All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next question for live stream people. Go ahead and vote. So which is a template or blueprint from which objects can be instantiated from? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and reveal in three, two, one. 79%, nice job on reveal for the live stream. Again, I'm gonna go over the answer in a second. All right. Okay, emojis when it plays, and let's go ahead and take a look in three, two, one. The answer is a class, is a template or blueprint from which objects can be instantiated from. So let's do an example that breaks down the differences between a class's methods and its variables. Say we wanted to create robots. The first thing we need to define is the blueprint for creating robots. This is what the class represents. Now in this blueprint, we have to define the actions that robots are going to perform. These are the methods of the class. Examples could be run or speak. These are actions that the robot class can perform. The next thing we need to define is the attributes of the robot blueprint. These will be things like its name and its color. These are characteristics or attributes of the robot blueprint. These are what are called variables to a class. Now we have defined our blueprint, which is representative of our class. We defined its actions or methods, and we defined its characteristics or variables. Now we can actually create instances of the robot class. So let's say we create two instances of the robot class. One is Wally, which has the value Wally for its name variable and has the value blue for its color variable. It also has the implementations for the run and speak methods. The other instance of our robot class is Fred, which has the value Fred for its name variable and has the value red for its color variable. It also has the same methods run and speak. These are two objects of the robot class. They are instances of the robot class. They are real things, not blueprints. Classes are incredibly useful to reuse the same blueprint to create many distinguishable instances. It's a great way, for example, to make a lot of different characters by reusing the same blueprint for them, but giving their variables different values to distinguish them. All right, can I get some emojis when that finishes? Emojis, everybody. Awesome. All right, okay, so let's go next question. So if objects are instances of the same class, they can have different values for their variables. Is that true or false? True or false? All right, I go next question for the live stream as well. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and reveal in three, two, one. Ninety-five percent. Wow, nice job, guys. Yeah, the answer is true. Again, I'm gonna go over the answer with the animation. When it does start playing, I'm revealing for live stream. Give me emojis, and we'll check it out in three, two, one. The answer is true, and the reason it's true is if we just look at our example where we're talking about Wally and Fred which are instances of the class robot, they had different values for the same attributes. So the robot Fred had the value Fred for its attribute name, while Wally had the value Wally for its attribute name. So even though they're instances of the same robot class, they have different values for their variables.
This is one of the main benefits of using classes. You can create objects which have the same basic infrastructure, like having the same methods and having the same variables, but you can have different values for those variables in order to differentiate them. As we saw, Fred and Wally are both robots, but, but they are different in that they have different values for their name variables, with robot Fred having the value Fred for its name, while Wally having the value Wally for its name. All right, emojis when that finishes. Awesome. All right, so now we're gonna move on to vectors. I'll take one or two questions um, because we do have the alumni talk coming up, so we can't spend too much time on this. Uh, but if you do have a question, I'm gonna go ahead and remove all hand raises. And then I want you to re-raise your hand because we have a ton of hand raises right now. All right, so if you do have a question, press the raise hand button and I'll be able to answer it. All right, any questions, press the raise hand button. It gets in your bottom right. If not, we can go on to vectors. So explain 2D and 3D vectors. All right, uh, let's see. It looks like we don't have any questions. All right, are we all good to move on? I see one question on the live stream. Uh, can you instantiate objects that don't have classes? Um, you need a class in order to instantiate an object. The class is basically the blueprint for instantiating objects. So, okay, awesome. Uh, oh, we have one question. Let's go to uh, easy. Uh, let's go to easy or red. Uh, you should be megaphone now. Hmm. Not hearing any audio there. Okay, we'll have another section of questions before we bring on the alumni speakers. So I recommend if you do have questions, write them down um, so that we can call on you. Uh, but we're going to move on to vector math. So we're going to be explaining 2D and 3D vectors. It's going to work the same. We're going to play an animation, basically explaining the concepts for you first. And then we're going to have some questions, but we're also going to explain every answer with an animation as well. All right, is everybody on the same page with that? Emojis, again, animation should play. All right, so we're going to break it down to two parts. First is a vector one. So this is going to be talking about uh, one part of the explanation, and then we'll play another animation after. Give me emojis when it starts playing. Now let's go ahead and take a look in three, two, one. So we're going to be discussing a critical concept for Unity, which is vectors. Vector quantities have two attributes, direction and magnitude. It is important in game development, as many times you have to not only tell an object how far to move, but also in what direction. This is where vectors are used. A vector is simply a line between two points that has a length, which is called its magnitude, and a direction. They are usually represented by an arrow, with the tip of the arrow indicating its direction and its length indicating its magnitude. If you have played the game Angry Birds before, the arrow you set to launch the bird is a vector, as you specify the direction which the bird should fly, and the amount of force that you apply to the bird by increasing or decreasing the length of the vector is its magnitude. Let us first look at 2D vectors, which are vectors working on the XY plane and would be used for 2D games. Let's say we are trying to move our player in a certain direction. Let's say we want our player to move three units to the right and one unit up. We then create a vector going in that direction. We can now move our player along that vector. This vector would be represented by open angle bracket 3, comma 1, close angle bracket, as it moves positive 3 in the direction of the x-axis and positive 1 in the direction of the y-axis. Let's explore a use of finding a vector's magnitude. Say we have an enemy and a player object. Our game logic says that if the enemy is within 4 units of the player, we will fire at the player. So we need to check whether we are close enough for the enemy to fire at them. We know the enemy's position is 1, 2, because it's 1 away from the origin along the positive x-axis and 2 units away from the origin along the positive y-axis. On the other hand, the player's position is 3, 5, because the player is 3 units away from the origin along the positive x-axis and 5 units away from the origin along the positive y-axis. We can find the vector going from the enemy to the player by subtracting the position of the enemy from the player. We do this by subtracting the x and y components of the enemy from the player. So we do 3, the player's x position, minus 1, the enemy's x position. 
which gives us the vector's x component too. We do the same for the y, where we take the player's y position of five and subtract the enemy's y position of two and get the vector's y component three. Thus, we get our vector three, two going from the enemy to the player. If we now draw this vector starting at our enemy object, we see it leads us to the player, which makes sense. Now we need to find the length or the magnitude of the vector. The magnitude of a vector is equal to the square root of the sum of the x and y components squared. The reason for this equation can be explained using the Pythagorean theorem, with the length or the magnitude of the vector representing the hypotenuse of the triangle, and the x and y coordinates of the vector representing the other two sides of the triangle. So when we plug in our vector's x and y values, that gives us the square root of 9 plus 4, which equals a square root of 13, which is around the value 3.6. Since this is less than 4, which is the max distance the enemy can be from the user in order to fire on the player, the enemy will be able to fire on the player. All right, emojis, when that one finishes playing, we can go to the second one. Awesome. All right, let's go to the second one, and we'll see some emojis when it plays in 3, 2, 1. Vectors in 3D work the same as 2D, but with a z-axis which represents depth. An easy way to remember the directions of each axis is using the left-hand rule. If using your left hand, you point your index finger in the direction of the positive y-axis and your thumb in the direction of the positive x-axis, your middle finger will point in the direction of the positive z-axis. This will allow you to always know the direction of a third axis if you know the direction of the other two. Another great use of vectors is for representing the velocity or speed of an object. For velocity, there is always a direction and magnitude to indicate how fast and where an object is going, which makes vectors a perfect representation. Let's do an example in 3D and say we have a car object at position 3, 1, 4, and it has a velocity of 2, 1, 2 per hour, which means after one hour, the car moves 2 in the direction of the positive x-axis, 1 in the direction of the positive y-axis, and two in the direction of the positive z-axis. After one hour, where will the car be? To figure that out, we must first realize that since our velocity vector is given in the time unit of one hour, and we're asked where the car's position will be after one hour, we have to add the full value of the velocity vector. So the way we find the car's new position after one hour is by adding the velocity vector, two, one, two, to its original position, three, one, four. Also note that positions are denoted with open and closed parentheses, while vectors are denoted with open and closed angle brackets. So the way we add a vector to a position is by adding each of the individual x, y, and z components of the position to the individual x, y, and z components of the velocity vector. So we add 3, the x component of the position, to 2, the x component of the velocity vector, which gives us 5 as the final x position. We do the same for the y, so we add 1, the y component of the position, to 1, the y component of the vector, which gives us a final y position of 2. Finally, we do the same for the z, so we add 4, the z component of the position, to 2, the z component of the vector, which gives us a final z position of 6. So the car's position after 1 hour is going to be 5 to 6. Notice this is a final position, not a final vector. When you add a vector and a position, you get a position. It's like if I tell you to move forward one step from where you are. The new position you're at is not going to have a direction or a magnitude, it's just going to be a point in space. So this concludes the basics of working with vectors in Unity. They are going to be incredibly important for checking the distance between objects, giving objects or forces directions, and understanding how objects will react to physics. All right, emoji when that finishes. All right, so let's hop into some questions. So same, it's gonna work the same as it was before. Uh, one sec, let me just, okay, here we go. All right, so yeah, works the same as it was before. Vote A, B, C, or D, and then let me get the live stream going as well. Live stream, it's the same link for you guys. I'm gonna go to the next question for you all. And again, we're gonna go over the animation the, with the answers regardless.
So I'll give you guys enough time for this. If you need to take some time, maybe write down a piece of paper. That's awesome. That's, that's fine as well. All right. Question asking, what is the value of the vector going from the red to the blue point? So make sure to use the values between these. And again, if you don't get this right, don't worry. We'll have an animation visualizing the answer. All right. All right, I'm going to go ahead and reveal the answer in three, two, one. All right, so 52% said B. Again, we'll go over the answer in a second. Uh, let me reveal for the live stream as well. Okay, all right, em emojis when it starts playing. Let's go ahead and check it out in three, two, one. So we're asked to find the value of the vector going from the red to the blue ball. Now, the way we're going to find that vector is by subtracting each of the X, Y, and Z components of the red ball from the blue ball. So that means we're going to start by doing 1, which is the X component of the blue ball, minus 4, which is the X component of the red ball. That will give us the value of negative 3. We'll do the same for the Y. Subtract 1 from the red ball to 3 from the blue ball, which gives us 2. And finally, for the Z component, we'll subtract 1, which is the Z component of the red ball, from 4, which is the Z component of the blue ball, which gives us 3. So that gives us our eventual vector, which is going to be negative 3, 2, 3. The last thing to mention is that this is a vector starting from the red ball and going to the blue ball. So that is the vector's direction. All right, emojis when that finishes for you. Awesome. All right, let's go to next question. So what is the value of the vector going from 210 to 416? In live stream, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next question for you guys as well. All right, I'm gonna reveal in three, two, one. All right, 63%, not bad, so two, six. Okay, let's go ahead and reveal the answer for the live stream and then we'll take a look at the animation. All right, emoji we're gonna place and we'll see it in three, two, one. Oh, right, okay, this one doesn't have the animation. Yeah, so I can quickly explain this one. Um, let me get my little thing around here. Okay, so the question is asking, what is the value of the vector going from two uh, 10 to 4, 6. Now, the first thing we mentioned in the explanation was that vectors are indicated by angle brackets. Uh, so you'll notice here that out of the options, only A and C have angle brackets. So automatically, you can eliminate B and D. When you have parentheses, those indicate points in space. So again, a vector is not a position in space. A vector is defined by both a direction and a magnitude. So you can eliminate B, uh, sorry, yeah, B and D because they are not vectors, they are positions. So the second question asks is, how do you actually calculate the value of the vector? So one is knowing where it's starting from and where it's ending. So we're told that it starts from 210 and it goes to the position in space 416. So we want to subtract the starting position from the end position. And we do that on a X and Y component individually. So we start with the X component of the end position and then subtract from that the X component of the starting position. So that'll be four minus two. And that gets us the value of 2. Now we do the same for the y component, which is 16. So we subtract the y component of the initial position, 10, and we get 6. And that's how we end up with the answer to 6. Does that make sense, emojis? Awesome. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the next question. All right, this one does have an animation. So John starts at position 1, 4. His velocity vector is 2, 2, 2 per hour. 
what will be John's position after one hour? And live stream, I'm going to go to the next question for you guys as well. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and reveal in three, two, one, 80%, nice. Now I do wanna mention something very important because um, this is a common frustration we get with students. So in Unity, you don't actually have to do um, direct vector math. The reason why we're covering this is to give you a general understanding of three-dimensional calculations, which you know, in Unity, especially building for VR and XR, you're going to have to understand a little bit about three-dimensional space. So don't look at this. I know a lot of people are, are not the biggest fans of math, I'm going to see this and they get discouraged. This is the only time we cover a mathematical concept uh, specifically. And again, these calculations are something you don't need to do in Unity. Unity handles these calculations for you. But we like to cover it at the beginning, to give you a general basis in understanding how those calculations are taking place. So please don't feel afraid when you see mathematics like this. Um, this is not going to be required for you to do when you actually do Unity. It's not going to be something on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's just something to help you get an understanding of how Unity is working and doing these calculations, you know, for dictating the direction of your player movement, for understanding forces in Unity and how they interact. Understanding a bit about vectors, their magnitudes and directions and how they're calculated uh, can be important for that. But it's, again, something we use for background. It's not something that you're going to be calculating yourself or doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, emojis, everybody clear on that? Yeah, this is something we commonly get. I'm scared of math. You know, this is not a math math heavy class at all. Uh, we don't rec we don't require any experience beforehand, uh, whether it be Unity or C sharp programming. As long as you're 13 years or, or older, you're able to go through our class, and we designed our pipeline to take you from a complete beginner to building and publishing your own VR app. Okay, but with that, let's go ahead and take a look at the animation. Just wanted to get that out of the way before we got too far into it. So we're gonna take a look at the animation. Emojis when it starts playing, and we'll see it in three, two. Okay, so this question is saying we're starting at position 141 and we have a vector moving in the direction 2, 2, 2 per hour. And we're asked, what will John's position be after one hour? So that means that the 2, 2, 2 vector is going to be added in whole. So how do we add vectors? We do that by adding each of their individual components. So the first thing we need to add is the 2 which is the x component of our velocity vector, to the x component of John's position, which is 1. So that will give us the new x position, which will be 3. And now we do the same for the y and z components. So now we'll add 4, which is John's y component, to the velocity vector's y component, which is 2. This will give us 6. Lastly, we add John's z component, 1, to the velocity vector's z component, 2, which gives us three. So we're basically adding each of the X, Y, and Z components of the position and velocity vector to get our new position. And that's how we do vector addition. All right, emojis when that finishes for everybody. Awesome. All right, so let's go to next question. So it's a similar concept, but in two dimensions now. I'm gonna go to next question for the live stream as well. Okay, so question is asking if you're at point zero two and the vector you add, or then you add the vector negative three two, what point do you get? So what position do you end at? So similar concept to what we just covered, but in two dimensions.
All right. All right, and let's go ahead and reveal. And oh, one sec. All right, let's go ahead and reveal in three, two. Oh, wait, one sec. Here we go. Okay, three, two, one. Seventy-two percent. Nice job. Let's reveal for the live stream people as well. All right, so yeah, so same concept again. We're starting at point zero two, and we're adding the vector negative three two. So we're going to break it down on a component basis. So we're going to add the x component of the initial start position to the x component of our vector, which is negative three, which gives us a final position of negative three. So automatically, we can eliminate any other uh, answer choice that doesn't have negative three to start with. So we can eliminate uh, a and b. Now we do the same for the y component. So we're adding the y component of the initial position to the y component of the vector. So that's two plus two. That gives us four, which gives us our answer choice of C. So yeah, when you start at a position, like see I'm starting right here in this position in space and I add a vector, which again is a direction with a magnitude. You can visualize it as maybe taking, you know, for this one, three steps to the left and two steps forward, I end up at another position okay so a vector plus a position will be another position all right so let's go ahead uh, and go to the next question so what is the length of the vector called i'm going to go ahead and reveal its next uh, live stream All right, I'm going to go ahead and reveal in three, two, one. All right, 78%. Yep, yeah, the answer is magnitude. Let me reveal for the live stream people. All right. Let's go to the next question. So what is the magnitude of this vector? So what is the magnitude of this vector? Yeah, here you might want to get a pen and paper out. If you want to do the calculations, it might be a little bit difficult to do in your head. The equation you want to use is the square root of the sum of the x component squared, the y component squared, and the z component squared. So basically, x component squared plus y component squared plus z component squared and the square root of that sum. So if you want to get a, uh, you can do it in your head, awesome. If you want to take off your headset and write it down for a sec, that's also great. I'll give you some time to do that. Um, yeah, so no rush. And we'll go over the answer regardless. So. Don't worry if um, you're not able to get it this front. All right, we're getting to it again. The we're doing the x component squared plus the y component squared plus the z component squared and the square root of that sum. So what do we get there? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and reveal in three, two, one. 80%, wow, nice job guys. All right, we're gonna go over the answer. So we'll take a look at the animation in three, two, one. So the question asks, what is the magnitude of this vector referring to the vector four, two, two? Now there's two important things to know about a vector. One is the magnitude, which we'll be doing today, which is the length of a vector, and the other is direction. Remember, vectors are always in reference from the origin. So it's four, two, two from the origin point. So let's break down how we get to that vector. So we break it down into the x, y, and z components of the vector. The x component being four, which means we move positive four in the direction of the x-axis. And then the y component, which is two. 
So we move two in the positive direction of the y-axis. And then we finally go to the z component, which is two, which means we move two in the direction of the positive z-axis. And that's how we arrive at the vector you see in the graph. Now, once we understand how to formulate those vectors, let's now understand how to find the magnitude. The magnitude is found using a formula of square root of the x component squared plus the y component squared plus the z component squared. So all we need to do is fill in those values. For the x component, we have 4, so that's 4 squared. The y component is 2, so that's 2 squared. And the z component is 2, so 2 squared as well. Doing a bit of math, that gives us 16 plus 4 plus 4, which is 24. So the magnitude of this vector would then be square root of 24. You can also do this in Unity using the vector3.magnitude function to save you some time. All right, emojis when that finishes for everybody. Awesome. All right, so let's do the same calculation, but this time we're doing 2D. So we don't have a Z a component anymore, it's just X and Y. So again, we're doing the X squared plus Y squared and the square root of that. So I'll give you a second if you want to get a pen and paper out or you know, do it in your head, use a calculator. Give everyone some time to do that. And let me go and go to the next question for live stream. This will be our last question. Then we're gonna move into the alumni talk. Um, I'll take some questions from the audience after though. So we're almost through vectors. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and reveal in three, two, one. 90%, nice job, let me reveal for the live stream. All right, so just to quickly go over this, it's the same process we described before. So the formula again is taking x squared plus y squared and then the square root of that sum. So our x component is four, we're going to square that, which is 16. And we're gonna add the y component squared, so five squared, which is 25. So 16 plus 25 equals 41. And then we take the square root of that sum, which gives us C. Does that make sense, everybody? Emojis? That's how we find the magnitude. Awesome, okay. All right, so we're not gonna go into WebGL today, um, but I do wanna take some questions from you. We are gonna be having our alumni come up uh, and giving a talk on navigating job opportunities in XR. Uh, but let's take some questions from the audience first. So I'm going to dismiss all hand raises, re-raise your hand if you have a question. That way I know they're fresh. And live stream people, drop your questions in the chat. Okay. Let's, okay, so I'm going to call on you. When I do call on you, uh, you're going to be able to unmute yourself and megaphone. Please do, and then you'll be able to ask your question. All right, let's go to Ricky. Ricky, you should be megaphoned. Hmm. Yeah, having a hard time hearing Ricky. Let's go to uh, Triton. Uh, so for the vector mapping, uh, the values for X, Y, Z, are those static um, within Unity or do they change? Are they like editable attributes yeah. from world to world? So like the values of X, Y, Z? Yeah, so it depends on what that vector represents. So say it's a... Say it's like a force in space. Maybe you're like, say, let's uh, let's see, like um, a vector could be, say, the um, we could say, let's do the speed or yeah, the speed or velocity of a car, right? That speed can change. That velocity can change as the driver, you know, presses on the gas and speeds up the car. Or you know, for a user, it might be holding down the space bar. Um, so the the vector, the values could change based on the user input. Um, you know, if you're doing a force and the user maybe, especially if you're in VR and you have some sort of throwing mechanic, if the user moves their controller at a faster speed, the vector representing that speed or velocity will also increase in value. Um, so 
Yeah, vectors can definitely change in, in value uh, as you get different inputs from the user or as your game progresses. You know, say um, you have an enemy that just falls off a cliff and you have a vector representing the um, velocity of it moving downwards because you have some sort of gravity force. Those values will change as the enemy gains acceleration and starts moving faster as he hits heads to the ground. So yeah, vector values 100% can change um, and you can access them in a script in unity you can also make them a public variable or public that uh, yeah public variable for you to check that those values in the inspector window in unity as well so yeah 100 percent uh vector values can change you know positions can change as well if the user moves their transform position will change as well you know if i'm here and then i move here my position value changes if i'm moving forward you know just with my joystick i'm at a constant velocity that vector is being static it's not changing value but if i hold my trigger I'm moving faster and there my values of my vector will increase. Okay, other questions? Let's go to uh, French Lee. Um, so I just wanna make sure, I, I, I think what he was asking was what I was just asking. If we have um, a game or whatever that we're programming, it's the yes. same characters, but a different game. Uh, we can use those same calculations, like without mm. having to reprogram them. Or, mm. um, okay, so let's see. If it's a different game, I would say you could re like. It depends on how you're using the vector, but like, say you're using a vector to monitor like whether, let's say, like a plane for takeoff, right? So you're trying to like um, simulate a plane launching from an airport. And you want to say like, okay, once its velocity vector hits a certain speed, then the plane can start moving up in a realistic fashion. So you can have a program like that, that, you know, detects the velocity vector of a plane object. And once it hits a certain value, allow the plane to start lifting off. And then you could reuse that program for different planes. Um, so you can obviously reuse the calculations you do, depending on what you're doing uh, and have like, yeah, the same kind of functionality for it. Um, I try, yeah. Try my best with that question. Um, hopefully that gave you some value. If you have any more questions, again, come up to me afterwards. We're going to break out into another world. We can go more in depth with things. I did get a question from the live stream. Um, are graduates finding jobs in games or other type of VR, or other type of applications in VR? Um, so I'll give a brief answer to that um, because I, I'm sure you guys have heard me talk a lot about um, graduation and employment in our workshop. Uh, to give you a brief overview of some of the places that where our students have worked, actually you're going to be hearing two of them uh, come up. So Adam Farouk, who's the uh, senior technical program manager at Walgreens, Justin Chow went through our courses as well, uh, project manager at Bad VR. Um, we also have uh, web AR developers at Continuum. We have a VR level designer at Supernatural. Uh, we have head of product at Carnival. Carnival. Um, we have um, developers for the Burning Man and VR Festival. Uh, in fact, today, I won't disclose the company, but I was asked by one of our alum who got one of these, you know, kind of larger positions in one of these VC backed startups to ask for recommendations for people to fill their positions. Um, so what I like to say, a lot of people ask, like, what's the difference really between, you know, taking a bunch of video courses uh, and doing what you guys do, you know, having live courses in the metaverse, it's really the community aspect. And we're going to have the two alum talk about the power of community and network, but just as important as your you know technical skills and your ability is the ability to have relationships in the industry you know as you guys know information has become quite dispersed with the internet anyone can get access to you know learning videos at this point so everyone's almost getting to a similar level playing field so the distinctions when someone's hiring someone or presenting them an opportunity is a lot of times going to come back down to how well they know them and their network um, so that's why we don't only focus on you know training and give you the content obviously we have experiences we have our self-produced videos we have this discord to get questions answered grading etc but just as important to that is making sure you guys are forming relationships within our community so you have connections with the industry whether you want to get employment or whether you want to start your own company you're going to have people that you know in terms of developers in terms of hiring managers that can get you started and connected within the industry um, so we do that through our socials um, we do that by having breakout sessions after every one of our classes through our discord uh, and we also have group projects in the third and fourth course where you're actually going to be working with a team of two to three fellow students and building your VR app on a weekly basis and eventually publishing it to the Oculus Store, uh, or Oculus App Lab Store, I should say. Um, yeah, so the community aspect is just as going to be as important as your ability to build content. And that's one of the things we do as a live program and we find better 
um, by doing in the metaverse versus, you know, a Zoom call where most of the time everyone has their cameras off, if we're being honest. And once a Zoom call ends, you know, everyone's gone. But in the metaverse here, when we have breakout sessions, you know, one person leaves, that doesn't affect the flow just like you would in real life. It's a constant, persistent space where everyone can meet and communicate just like they would in person. And we're, that's what we're doing as an organization is capturing that in-person learning environment that's so critical that you get at a university or you get at a boot camp, but making it way more affordable and convenient by doing it in the metaverse. And as far as we know, we're one of the first to do it. Um, so yeah, I, I'm excited for you guys, hopefully for you to enroll with us and join our community. Um, you know, we've been doing this for three years. Now we're seeing basically all the people that started with us in the beginning as this metaverse space has taken off, get key positions in the industry, which is fantastic. Um, so, you know, as what hap as, as what's happening to us, we've seen, you know, three times as many students sign up in, the, in this month and we're growing pretty much exponentially. The same was gonna happen if the metaverse continues to develop for you guys that are getting these skills. Because what happens is now that the field is becoming mature and these companies and initiatives want to have people lead their, you know, new metaverse ventures and they want people with experience and have done this before. So it's important to get into an industry that's going to go through explosive growth early because when it does reach a lot of maturity and investment, which is what's happening right now, you're going to be the one that has the experience in the background to lead the next ventures into this. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a beautiful site. We've done really, our program stayed consistent. Yeah, we've seen three times as many students purely because more people are interested in the metaverse. And that kind of same principle could also apply for employment and job demand. Um, you know, last year, we saw for a 1400% a 1400 growth in AR and VR jobs, a 600% growth in demand for game engine skills like Unity and Unreal. Um, so it's a very exploding industry um, and it's a great time to get in now. I've, we've been doing this for three years. You know, people thought it was ridiculous three years ago. Now it's becoming more mainstream. Um, so this is the most explosive growth and highest kind of growth in demand that I've seen without within the three years I've been teaching in the metaverse. So. Um, you guys are coming in a really great time and you're going to get, hopefully get access to our community and hopefully contribute to the community. Don't just go through the courses, doing the work, turning it in and not really communicating with anybody. You want to make sure that you form relationships, not only with us as the instructors, but also your peers. Okay. Um, what time is it? Okay. Uh, I want to see is Adam and Justin here. Let me see. Uh, oh, there's Justin. Okay. Awesome. I see. Oh, there's Adam. All right. Uh, yeah, I got to get them set up uh, because we're running a little bit low on time. So I'm going to bring up the presentation. Um, they're going to be talking kind of actually uh, a bit more of what I was mentioning uh, right now, uh, but in a way more like structured and uh, better sense. So I'm going to bring up the slides for them. And then Adam and Justin, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, get you guys a uh, megaphone after. So let me first bring up your slides here. All right. Move back the quiz. Bring the projector up. We do that for all the rooms here. Yeah, you guys should be able to come on stage. I'm just getting your quiz up and running or your slides. And let me move this back. All right. You guys should see like a big gray screen behind my avatar here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and connect to it. Okay. So we're going to start streaming. Oh, also, yeah, if you haven't signed up, for, I forget, I haven't, I usually mention this more often, but if you haven't signed up for the raffle yet, we are giving away our introduction to Unity and C-Sharp programming course. If you haven't entered that yet, go ahead and click on the link above. If you're in Altspace or click on the link in the live stream, uh, Tony is going to post that. Uh, this is the last opportunity to sign up. We're going to be revealing the raffle winner after. Uh, we go through this awesome talk with Justin and Adam. So make sure to do that. You're also going to get the recording from today and also entrance to our Google Classroom. All right, so let's go to broadcast here. Okay, so you guys should see uh, a slide deck behind me. Let me know if you see it. Everybody see it? Can I get some emojis? Just want to get confirmation from y'all. All right, awesome. Okay, all right, yeah. Can you guys uh, come off the stage? You should be able to go live. Um, can you uh, do? Can you unmute yourselves, or maybe I should do that by? Okay, I'll call your. And raises there. Yeah, can you hear me? I yeah, think is that... I, uh, mine works, right? Yeah, uh, Adam, do you want to uh, raise your hand? I'll megaphone you as well. Uh, let's see. It should be like a raise hand. But... Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, Adam, say something. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear Adam okay? Is there a... Maybe turn up the mic a little bit. 
think it should be fine. Uh, oh, yeah, there we are. Now. Oh, perfect. My voice. Yeah, that's way better. <laughs> yeah. Not bad. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I, yeah, let me do, I'm going to run through a quick intro, and then I'll hand it off to you guys. Yeah, so first off, let's thank Adam and Justin for coming in and giving this presentation. They made this presentation on their own uh, without even me asking. I was very happy they've done this now, like the third time they've come in and give this talk to our students. Um, so we really appreciate them taking the time to come talk to us, put this presentation together, and kind of share their learnings from going through uh, the job market and translating from a different career into XR. Um, so they've been doing awesome things in the industry. Um, they've been super helpful to our community. Um, and yeah, uh, Adam's going to be taking questions after. Uh, so we'll hopefully get at some questions for everyone uh, at the end. But yeah, they have a slight, uh, maybe 30 minute presentation. Then we'll take some Q&A after. All right. Yeah. I'll go ahead and let you guys uh, take over here. Hey, hey uh, thanks, Justin. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I kind of like to talk about a little bit is just about me and Justin and this kind of topic of breaking into XR uh, with us um, and kind of take you on a journey about like how we got into the XR industry and some of our learnings behind there. So over here on the right, you see uh, me, that's me in, uh, in real life, <laughs> as you probably have guessed. <laughs> and over on here the on the left. In real life. <laughs> yeah, we're people, you know, we've done that, but we're trying to humanize this path for you. And for the first few slides, show you, you know, our, the backgrounds we came in with. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I'm a project manager at a, a startup called Bad VR. We do data visualization. And Adam. Yeah, uh, I work at. Uh, I, I work at Walgreens um, and specifically focusing on uh, Walgreens Health. Um, and then uh, I just recently got uh, promoted um, from a product manager uh, focusing on virtual experiences to a senior technical product manager focusing on virtual experiences um, and augmented ones for um, our healthcare. We go to the next slide, All right? Okay, yeah, so what you're seeing here is kind of a comparison chart um, between me and Justin. So on the left, uh, you have me, uh, I'm Adam, <laughs> and on the right, you have Justin. So let's go from top to bottom and just kind of uh, cycle through here um, so I'll go first, and then Justin will go next. Um, so for me, um, obviously, you know, uh, you know my position already uh, and where I work, um, and the, the size of my organization is quite large. Um, so there's lots of opportunities um, within the, the Walgreens Corporation. Um, and so a little bit about myself. Um, I have an architecture background um, as well as a full stack web development background. Um, so some of the things that you might not know is that it, for me, uh, my hunt duration was uh, within a year or less than right around that year mark. Um, and so for me, uh, my initiative was really trying to like where I was working at the time was to kind of focus on the projects that I really want to do for that for that business. So for me, what I ended up doing was I. I wanted to form an XR group at work. Um, and so what I did was I kind of became this sort of in-house specialist. That's how I kind of introduced this idea, like where I'm at today. Um, so it's something that you can do for free. You know, you don't have to go too far um, and it's, it's pretty effective because people will start to see you in this different kind of light. Um, in terms of training, obviously universe. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, it was a good one for me, and it helped me understand uh, really uh, the key kind of understanding of, of what you need to get to really excel in this XR, um, like in this XR landscape, really. Um, and what I ended up doing was I ended up working on a lot of personal projects, um, and I would integrate those pro projects. And in, in, I would integrate into those projects. Um, into the um, into my work, but also into the work of universe. So what I mean by that is um, these projects were really uh, it exemplify the in industry that I'm in. And so and we can talk about what that strategy is. Um, so I was working in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. So in terms of what the projects that I was working on were really focused on the 
AEC industry. Um, and so it was really purposeful. Um, and, and therefore, my strategy in networking was also very purposeful. Um, so if we look down to the networking and strategy piece, um, you'll see that um, a lot of my strategy was uh, the AEC industry connections. I also looked to other software, software companies like Autodesk um, to kind of make more connections in there um, through their conferences. Um, and then I ended up actually creating a, a, a project for the AEC industry that ended up getting published by Unity, Unity Technologies themselves. Um, so that got me a lot of like, uh, I guess uh, a lot of people kind of noticed what that was. And, and so basically that kind of accelerated my, my networking strategy. Um, so the Unity industrial team asked me to, to come internally and present to them uh, some of the the learnings that I ended up discovering for the AEC industry because um, they were and interested in what Do you define what A stands for? Yeah, AEC is uh, is short short for Architecture, Engineering, and Construction Industry. So, um, and that's what I was, uh, and that's the industry that I was in. It I was inside, um, and and so the Unity team at the time was really uh, developing their industrial section, and they were really kind of interested in some of the some of the products that I was uh, developing for the architecture company that I was working for at the time. Um, so my intent was really to kind of create this sort of feedback loop on my resume and my portfolio. Um, so a lot of the work that I was showing was really relevant to the industry that I was already in. So that was a good key strategy because a lot of the products that I would create were really focused on that industry. It was really, it was really helpful for that industry and in, in solving problems. Um, and so for me, like obviously in office was a strategy for channels, Unity technologies themselves, um, as well as LinkedIn, Discord, and Altspace VR in terms of social. Um, and so for me, that was really key to a lot of my success, like creating a network in these channels was really helpful um, for, for like long-term relationships. Um, and then beyond that, really the focus was my personal projects um, and then that making them AEC specific. Um, and that really helped me create conversations with a lot of people, but also conversations here at Universe. Um, so when you end up creating projects with others, you know, it'd be, it'd be great if you can find people that also are in your same industry and, and share the same uh, mission as you. Um, and that would be uh, really ideal if you can. Um, and then obviously my attitude the whole time I was, I was, I was working um, in, uh, with, with Universe, but also uh, working at my job was to like wake up early and stay up late. So, like wake up early in the sense of do your homework, do your, you know, work on Unity or uh, work on Universe projects, then also focus on your, your mission, uh, you know, to help your industry or break into that industry. So your, your portfolio should reflect your intentions to go into that industry. Um, and um, my personal, so basically what ended up happening was um, I had a referral from Unity Technologies um, that was already working for the company I'm currently in today. Um, and they were like, hey, Adam's working on a lot of the stuff that you're thinking about as well. So why don't you two connect? And that's how I got into the company I'm in today. Awesome. Um, yeah, so on the right is my path uh, summary. Um, so same same fields. As you can see, it's a little different. I am a project, not a product manager. Um, I can help clarify what that means a little later, but um, one is more internal, one is more external, one is more internal. Um, I wanted to go um, into uh, actually a job that provided a little more um, challenge. Uh, I had always been working at a very large company ready. And uh, so that was one criteria. And of course, I wanted to get into XR. Um, so I found this startup called Bad VR. It's a data visualization company. Um, so much different than what Adam's already in. Um, but for me, I wanted that challenge and I wanted to have a little more leadership role. That's what I got when I, when I uh, got into Bad VR. Um, well, my background already before, I was an automotive engineer at a large auto OEM. Um, 
so I have a lot of things already with, uh, say, like more technical work. Um, and I also taught before. I was teaching uh, kindergartners through sixth graders uh, in STEM. And um, really wanted to use some of these skills and these foundations to apply towards thing bigger than me. And so the start for me was a little more attractive. I was able to crank out a job within uh, six months. Um, and, and that was a lot of front work, I'll tell you now, um, in terms of networking. Um, so what happened was I took a lot of initiative to go to competitions, to find people to talk to and to understand their journey. And I also did a little volunteering. Um, that's something that a lot of people neglect, actually. Volunteering in general, uh, no matter if it's for your job or related to your job directly or indirectly, there's always a lot of fantastic opportunity to meet people and, and learn and also improve a lot of your skills that you might not uh, really think about um, that are more among the personable and uh, non-technical skills that really get you in the door sometimes the first interview. I did some training with the universe. Uh, at the time, I was looking for something that was more self-paced and something that I could control my schedule with. Um, and into networking, which is the biggest thing we talk about here. So the path is a little bit more, uh, I would say, brute force. Um, I really wanted to go into the uh, shotgun approach and many people as I could into my, to my network. Um, so I actually attended the peak of uh, my job search, uh, over three events per week. An event could be, you know, like attending some kind of talk to a competition or even just sitting in a lecture. Um, and that actually led to, uh, I would say, I call them coffees, uh, really the virtual coffees. Uh, when we had COVID, is when a lot of this was done. Uh, it was just a lot of Zooms or even Google Meets or, or whatever platform people preferred, even a, a phone call. And I did that with four to five uh, XR professionals at the end of the day. And you'll see it in some of the next slides, um, some of the breakdown of what that looked like. And so my intent was to learn their origin stories, these people who are already in the industry, to find patterns and what would actually uh, make sense in terms of like, what, what is it that people uh, leaving Dawn or what was it that got them into the industry? And the channels that I did this to communicate with these professionals was uh, a bunch. You can see Twitter, LinkedIn. Discord, Slack, um, and various virtual platforms the events are hosted on, which some of them have built-in chat features, which is really nice. If you see someone that you think is really interesting, um, you can directly just chat them up in that event. And then my portfolio, um, I really put a lot of competition highlights in, and I put in some extracurricular projects too, because I was going for a project manager role, and I wanted to show people um, that, you know, even if I didn't have direct experience in some, in some areas, uh, it was something that was related to project management, and project management has to do with documentation. And so I wrote a lot of process of how I achieved some of my projects. Um, and then the other field was my attitude. So um, I went in with this attitude of leaving no stone unturned, really finding all the opportunities you can, and always um, oh, don't hesitate uh, when you see something, go for it. Because a lot of times, you might surprise yourself if um, you go towards something you didn't really think about before. Um, people really relish um, authenticity and, and just giving your best. And that's met with a lot of sincerity a lot of times when you contact people out of the blue. I'm just giving them you know, a reason of why, they, why we want to talk to them and they appreciate that. And that really carried me through a lot of this job hunt. Uh, and then in for me was uh, at the end of the day, a personal connection at an event. So that we paid off. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, yeah, so um, let's talk about personal projects real quick, because I think it's really important to understand um, like high level what we're talking about in terms of strategies for your personal projects and for your group projects. So while you're in, in specifically while you're taking your courses. So um, like I said, like I was I was working for an architecture company um, and I was really trying to understand like, OK, like what what project can I do uh, for this company? But at the same time, like what can I make as a portfolio that would make sense as a good story to tell my future employer? Right. Okay? Um, and to to really show them my my genuine interest into making something that, that 
that will help people and help the industry. And so um, because of this, because I'm in the uh, architecture industry, what I ended up doing is I ended up leveraging a, um, a, like a, a variety of, of things, things I was already working on and things I'm currently working on, right? Um, and so what, what that means is things I was already doing, like I said, I was also a full stack web developer. I leveraged that in my, in my portfolio as well to show, to tell a story, tell a story about what it is that I was working on before, what it is I'm working on right now, and what it is I want to work on into the, in the future. And so that story really helped make sense for people when they were trying to look for talent, right? So let's look at that. So what you can see is um, from the top, we'll go from the top. So virtual reality for property buying as a proof of concept. That is what you're seeing on the bottom right-hand corner as an image. So that was the outcome of that proof of concept. And then what you're seeing as the second one is um, the company name that I, I used to work for. Um, it was an AR application use, using Unity Reflect and Mapbox. And that was also a proof of concept. And that's one of the things that got published that, on Unity's website. So but with these two, um, with these two projects, they were really compelling, um, but they were also listed as one of the first projects in that portfolio because they were kind of the strongest um, to kind of show people what it is that I'm interested in and where I want to go. And a lot of people ask when they look at your portfolio, like, okay, like, how did you get here? And, and so there's a lot of story, backstory behind that. So like I said, I did a, an XR like internal group. And what we ended up doing is one of the first projects that we ended up doing was Using Unity, we actually made another application for like saw an opportunity for that com for that company for their 25th anniversary. We ended up making a, an application using Unity, an AR application for that anniversary for our clients, and so that sort of was the the opportunity for me to, to quote unquote like strike, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> um, on a project that was internal and that's something that was really something that allowed me to get more projects. And so what you're seeing above that, that third project is the projects that were quote unquote, like unlocked for me internally, and then also allowed me to kind of use that, that, that opportunity to work with universe and take those learnings and incorporate them into the classwork or into the coursework. So that's, what's really important to understand is that projects that you work on, I think should reflect your intentions and what you want to do for your industry um, and telling that story. And what you'll see is below that, that third project is something like, uh, like I worked on the website, the brand, uh, I worked on, uh, I was also a part of an internal um, group called Media Objectives. I also worked on that website and I worked on pro bono websites as well. And yeah, and then I also identified it was acquired. So, I mean, like, there's a lot of like, um, good things but then i did never forgot where i came from in the so computer science in vr course with the universe and alt space vr a lot of people want to know what the heck that was right they wanted to know what that was and that that caused deeper deeper conversations to happen that caused deeper conversations to happen internally for my work it also taught caused uh more conversation about the future of work right what is the future of work for this industry and also caused more conversations between the channels that I was socializing in with, with my peers um, in universe. So I think that that, it's a, that was a really strong and very authentic story for somebody that really wants to break into this industry. And so that's why I really am an advocate for um, working on a, a purpose a driven kind of project that will reflect your intentions. Um, but also I cannot deny the fact that Justin, who was able to get a job faster than, than me, like community is really important and, and, and relationships are extremely important and building those relationships and fostering them, like Justin has, has, has shown, will give you fast results as well, uh, if not more, more, more results. So um, keep that in mind as, like, as you move forward through your journey, that this is a balance and, and, and balancing between the two is really important.
Right. Yeah. Let's talk more about the uh, networking aspects that um, I was referring to. So uh, right here is a breakdown of the 45 professionals that I was able to get informational interviews with position. Um, the bottom will go through really quickly. This was done by me. Uh, the period was from June 2020 to October 2020. The platforms that I was sourcing these were from Zoom, Google Meets. I'm sorry, the platforms that I conducted these interviews were Zoom, Google Meets, and the sources were from all those in the bottom. So the um, left hand side of this graph is the number of individuals. The bottom are all the positions that um, I talked to. Founders, I talked to uh, PMs, in this case, as project or product managers. Here's, uh, there are people from the Mozilla Lifeboat, a special category for Mozilla. Producers, professor, community sales dude, a strategist, trainer, columnist, uh, researchers, recruiters, chief revenue officer, experts, so called expert. I don't know um, what qualified them as expert, that is, they had their title. Uh, UX designer, tech artist, executives, and specialists. And so in total, there were 45. Um, and out of these 45, 32 categorized as ones that actually gave me solid advice. And 13 of them were, uh, I would say, were more or less general advice, um, which was still valuable. Um, so you can see the majority of people I talked to were founders, which was really interesting um, because it was... Uh, out of this sample size, kind of gave me a sense of this is a very still young industry. People who were really um, you know, open to talking about it and trying to self grow it, people who were in a thick of it and, and really trying to inject new flavors and innovations was really exciting to me to think about. So that was a cool breakdown. Um, okay, so this gives you a glimpse of who I talked to. Let's now go into the advice that was given. Next slide. Okay, so the way I did this is I took all the advice, uh, all my, and I summarized every single one of those that gave me advice to just one top advice, so the number one advice that uh, I extracted. So I did a pie chart, um, and I categorized each of those number one advices into uh, either it was something that had to do with development, uh, something to do with publication, to do with networking, something to do with defining who you are, something that had to do with education. And something to do with competing. So let's go from development first. So four of the number one advice given had to do with development. I was told, be hands-on, learn development skills, learn Unity, Unity again. Really get into the nitty-gritty of the software. Really immerse yourself into what makes a, a, an experience and what it takes to actually generate some kind of um, gameplay, for instance, or something that actually has to do with app development. Get your hands dirty with that. Uh, publishing was interesting because uh, that was actually the majority, of, well, not the, almost the majority, one of the majority. Uh, so that was writing thought process, posting social, work on social media, post why and how you did your projects, post community projects, show your off work in community, use your own stuff, um, and then ship software product. By the way, the asterisk has to do with people who were uh, product or project managers. Those were important to me, again, because I was looking for that role. You can see here, Overall, this is saying, you know, get yourself out there and actually show people what you're doing. Um, and every single time I give this, this lecture, I make the analogy of you could have the best restaurant in town, right? The coolest food, the most savory things to eat. If you publish anything, it's not going to show up on Yelp. It's not going to get on this radar. Like, no one's going to know you have the best food in town. So you actually show people and, and have the guts actually post um, somewhere that is accessible. Now let's talk about networking. So seven were networking, uh, engage with LinkedIn recruiters, network like crazy, foster local relationships, have presence in industry events, keep showing up, network as much as possible, align with organizations and groups. You can see here, there's a lot of talk uh, advice about really getting into the community and not being afraid of engaging with people. Ultimately, Industry, just like everything, is made of people. Uh, we uh, go into uh, being conquered by robots and, and being digitized fully. You know, we're still people. We still have the ability to uh, learn from each other. And uh, people are social creatures. They want to help each other at the end of the day. So don't be afraid to uh, really connect individuals and professionals. Um, defining. This was uh, interesting to me. So 
Our advice uh, was about creating your niche. Follow what goes, feels good. Be distinct or be extinct. Find your strong suit. Market yourself for your role. Be good at your strengths. Engineer your own job. But this had to do with a lot with, um, you know, really know who you are like, and what you want. When you talk to people, make sure you have that and express that. Um, don't make a deduction. Really be pinpointed because that really helps drive your discussion and helps the other person you're connecting with especially someone who might not have enough time to talk with many, many people every single day, who took the time to really sit down with you and give you advice, give them specifics of what you want. Don't just go in with saying, oh, I just want a job. You know, that doesn't do you any good, doesn't do them any good. Add the discussion with niching down and figuring out what you really want and what you think you will uh, you know, need to get there. Then education. Uh, consume information like a vacuum. Be comfy with data. For experience first, have a hacker mindset. Prove technical and speaking skills and read newsletters. Read newsletters. This had to do with staying in the know, making sure that you're keeping a pulse on the industry, either through you know, news posts, uh, newsletters, uh, making sure that you at least have a general sense of what the industry is about. You don't go in with uh, a mindset of uh, again being a generalist. Be, be someone that has at least something to talk about, opinion about the industry. And then the last one was petitions, which for me was big because I wanted to actually get out there and, and learn faster. Uh, so someone just said it could be in hackathons, which is really valuable because hackathons are a great place to not only meet people, but also um, you know, learn fast and, and fail fast and fail hard, essentially. Um, and, and you learn a lot through that experience. Like Never be afraid to fail when you're in hackathons, and they really encourage that. You learn so much when you were in those. So that was the pie chart of the number one advice given. See, uh, let's go to the next slide. I, I guess we're pretty much at the end of it. Um, so to contact us, we're both pretty active on LinkedIn. In fact, we chat a lot on LinkedIn too. And the trade trade news, people love to actually see in contact on LinkedIn a lot of times. And sorry, and for surprisingly, uh, Twitter too. By the way, people have a lot of community in Twitter, so definitely go there. Um, so the bottom part is something that um, I wrote up. You can see on the left there. Uh, I, I tried to summarize a little more um, what I was doing for, for job hunting in the digital age. There's an article I wrote up. If you check it out. And I also, if you're interested in something more structured, um, I'm available to do more one-on-one -on -one coaching if you want to get into that um, and really break down what your strengths and weaknesses are and try to guide you towards some of these these best practices of going through the motion of actually getting a job in this industry. That's something that I offer. Uh, Adam, did you want to say anything else about contacting you? Uh, oh, yeah, of course. Um, well, first, you know, uh, Justin is, um, you know, someone that you want to be friends with. Um, <laughs> so I highly recommend you reach out to him. <laughs> uh, he's very smart. Um, so he's being, you know, I just want to like emphasize that first. Um, and uh, as a coach, I'm sure you would get a lot out of that. Um, so please talk to him about about if you're about that if you're interested. Um, and then for me, um, my name is Adam Farouk, um, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And I'm happy to uh, answer any questions or any anything that is on your mind uh, and how to make that next step. Um, I I uh I don't consider myself like as uh, as great as a coach, but I can help you kind of unblock some of the things that are on your mind, um and um you know be friends with you um and uh you know if you need me, feel free to reach me on any on on any platform really. But I do like LinkedIn um, because it's a lot easier to manage right now. Yeah, I will say um one thing that's really important when you're networking on LinkedIn. Do not hesitate, do not fail to add a note. Really, really, really important. Or who you're contacting, especially if it's fresh, always add a note. Um, a couple of reasons for this. One, um, you can personalize your message before uh, you know, contacting them. Um, and it really gives you a sense of, as a recipient of that invitation, like, oh, you know, I, this person, you know, this is what they want, this is why you know, I should kind of talk to them. Second thing is, very, very busy people, especially, don't know who you are. So they get tons and tons of invitations. So you really want to stand out and give them an indication, this is where I met you, this is why I want to talk to you. So they know to actually click accept. Do not forget that. Always add a note. 
Um, happens to me sometimes as you go through this industry, like I get a lot of invitations and all of a sudden, I don't know who, what, where I met this person and I don't know why I'd be talking to them sometimes. Um, and unfortunately, that's the way it works with people who get a lot of invitations. They don't have the time to scroll through all of them, except, except, except they actually have to figure out, okay, are they talking to me? That happens a lot when you're talking to someone new outside of your comfort zone. Make sure you add an, the note every single time. Yeah, agreed. I think with that, yes, um, uh, we have about a couple minutes of questions. I will leave uh, on the dot at three, but um, we'll be around. Hey, Adam, you're going to stay around, right? Yeah, I'm here to answer questions. Um, so like, a, like I was saying, um, you, know, re you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, however, you can also reach out to me right now um, and ask questions. Awesome. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? Everybody hear me okay, emojis? Yeah, let's get to So I wanna do a few questions. You know, I think uh, we only got a few minutes with Justin and maybe some questions with Adam for a little bit. Uh, but first off, let's get some emojis to, for thanking them for coming in and putting together this presentation. Um, we're really thankful they kind of shared their learnings with us. I think it's super useful for people coming into the industry knowing what to expect. Um, yeah, what an awesome resource. Okay, but I wanna take some questions from the audience. So if you have a question in the live stream or alt space, drop it. Um, if you're on the live stream, drop in the live chat. Alt space people press the raise hand button. Uh, let me go ahead and extend this uh, event, make sure no one gets kicked out first. So I'm gonna clear the hand raises, all right? So I'm clearing hand raises. If you do have a question, oh, Justin, Adam, if you wanna raise your hands again, I realize I cleared yours as well. Um, <laughs> Re-raise your hand if you have a question, that way I know it's you know fresh questions. Okay. Let's see questions from the audience. All right, uh, calling Adams there. Okay, sweet. And then just Justin, let's go to Kenny. Hi everyone, you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Cool. Um, so um, I'm also coming from uh, an architectural background. Um, so like you, you mentioned mission. So what, like, I was just curious what your personal mission was because I'm trying to shape my mission I you know personally think XR is going to be the future but I am still shaping my future and shaping my story of that mission so I was just curious what your mission was absolutely um you know, I, I I'm glad that you're thinking about it this way and um, I think that you're on the right track in terms of trying to develop that like the mission, but your purpose, right? Because um, I think that's really what you want to, you're getting at. Um, high level, you know, for me, it was about helping people. It was people first kind of mission um, and solving problems that are um, more specific to that AEC industry. And so when we think about the AEC industry and architecture in particular, what does the architect really have a problem with? They have a problem with, uh, like, for example, um, orchestrating uh, the, the general contractor with the electrician and with the, and with the structural engineer and things like this, right? And, and, and also at the same time, figuring out what, you know, what's the law, um, what's the rules for that land and all that kind of stuff. So, when you think about the, the journey of an architect, um, you really kind of want to be people first. And I think being people first as part of your mission in terms of what you're, what you're trying to solve is really important for that, for that other person to understand why you care, right? Um, and so for me, um, my elevator pitch, I guess you could say, <laughs> was... Um, I'm someone that really likes to focus on being at the intersection of both the virtual environment and also the physical environment, right? And so, and that's really kind of a key point for the architecture industry. Um, so for me, it was a lot clearer for people to understand where I sit and where I'm focusing on. And that's why I was building AR projects in tandem with VR projects. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. Awesome. All right, um, can everyone hear me okay? I think, yeah, Justin's gonna run, so let's give Justin some emojis. Everybody gives Justin some emojis for coming out. Thank you so much, Justin. Thank you, everybody.
Yeah, don't hesitate to contact me on LinkedIn. Again, add a note, please. And I'll be happy to chat. You know, I'm always available to, to, you know, set up some time to just, even just a, a small, like, if you want something like that and the sense of where you are and, and what kind of things you could improve on. It's always pleasurable for me to help a fellow student in, a, in the university uh, coursework. Uni. Awesome. Thank you so much, Justin. Yeah, Everybody. thank you so much for coming. Thank you. All right. Okay, so, um, yeah, look, we're going to keep doing questions, but I did promise the class we'd reveal the raffle winner, um, and it's our initial four to six time period. So what we'll do is, Adam, if it's okay with you, just quickly reveal the raffle winner, and then we'll get back to questions. That sound good with you, Adam? Oh, let me megaphone you. Yeah. Let's put you on. Okay, sweet. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and reveal the raffle winner. Again, we're gonna do some more questions here for a bit with Adam, and then we're gonna go into our breakout world where you can ask us any questions and I'll talk more about Metaverse world building. Um, so the way the raffle works, as I mentioned before, is when we call your name, you have to be here in order to claim your prize, okay? So if I call your name and you don't identify yourself, we're gonna to go to the next person. Now, if you're in alt space, you need to come to the bottom of the stage so I can see your username and make sure that it's correlated to the person we called. Um, if I do have doubts, I'm going to ask your email, nicholas.barone at tryuniverse.com with the email that you use for the raffle. And that way I can validate it's the same person. All right. So live stream people, if we call on you, indicate you're here, say that's me. And again, if we do have doubts, we're going to ask you to email nicholas.barone at tryuniverse.com. So that's that I try universe up here. Okay. Is everybody ready? Everybody understand what's going on? Can I get some emojis? Emojis, guys. Everybody knows what's going on the raffle. Again, everyone's going to get the recording. Everyone's going to get access to the Google Classroom for the course. The deadline to submit payment for the course is this Tuesday night at 11 59 p.m. Eastern. The first, first course, Introduction to Unity and c -sharp Programming, is $199. Um, if you buy all four courses at once, uh, there is a full pipeline package, which basically saves you $1,000 by giving you 50% off. So I put the link to that uh, in the live chat. Uh, we are going to be doubling our prices for the next run uh, because we've seen basically a surge in demand for this run. As I said, three times as many students have signed up. Um, so I highly recommend joining this run and not waiting to a later run when we do double our prices. Um, another thing to mention is once you take one of our courses once, it's free forever. So you can retake any future run of the course completely free. Okay, but with that kind of logistics out of the way, let's go ahead and reveal the raffle winner. Emoji drum roll, please, everybody. Can we get some emojis in the live chat as well? All right. Okay, so the winner of our introduction to Unity in C Sharp programming course is Chaos. Is Chaos here? Again, if you're here, Chaos, you need to come to the bottom of the stage in order for me to identify you. Is chaos here? If chaos, oh, there's chaos. Okay, cool. Yep. All right, everybody give some emojis of chaos. Chaos, I'm gonna follow up with an email to get you set up. Uh, but congratulations on winning the course. Emojis, chaos, congratulations. All right, so yeah, I'm gonna be sending out follow information to everybody. Everyone's invited to Google Classroom. Uh, but let's bring Adam back up here. I, want, I know you guys still have a few more questions for him. Oh, we have a bunch of questions now, okay. Yeah, so let's take a few more questions for Adam. And then we're going to break off into our student-made metaverse world where you can come up and ask me questions and I'll talk more about uh, metaverse development. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and clear hand raises and I want you to re-raise your hand if you do have a question just because we don't have any overlap. All right, so does anyone have questions for Adam on the live stream too? All right, uh, live stream. Oh, Alex is asking... Yeah, Alex, yeah, LinkedIn would be the best place to get in contact. All right, let's go to, let's go to uh, Juan. Oh, here we go. Let's try Juan. Juan, are you here? How are you doing? Hi, how's it going, Juan? Hello. Uh, yeah, so I'm in the education industry. I'm a Spanish teacher and trying, I am trying to tap into this before, you know, it blows up. Oh, uh, what? Not how much, because I know it's going to blow up. But what do you see in the industry happening uh, as far as uh, metaverse education? And what do you recommend as a teacher jumping yeah. into? Got you. Hey, yeah. 
I mean, uh, so I'm not a teacher, but uh, you know, I know uh, I know Nicholas is, um, but I also know um, <laughs> so what he's doing is pretty great. Um, but um, but if you're looking for a different strategy from from Nicholas, um, there's actually a friend of mine, um, and this is why it's so important for you to network with your with your classmates and and with the universe um, uh, students um, because there's a there is a classmate that I've been keeping in contact with. His name is his, his username is Chris Fing. Chris Chris Fix. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so we've been we've been keeping in touch. And he actually one of the first things he did was uh, talk to the principal of his school um, about you know this this really great learning tool, right? Um, and kind of getting him excited about some of the things that he was working on in terms of the projects here at Universe. He actually did show a, like a, a, the principal and then also a large number of people on the on the board, I think he was talking about the board. Mm -hmm. um, so eventually that led to the board. Um, and, and so a lot of people ended up uh, really rooting for him because he saw the work that he was working on in uh, in, in universe, and one of the things that really stuck out, actually, what he was telling me was the uh, photogrammetry lesson. Yeah, you know? you, you, yeah. Are you still teaching that yeah. one? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the photogrammetry lesson was like really compelling to them um, because the technology was really interesting um, from an educational standpoint as well, and that really stuck out because of the realism that you get. Um, and so the the that kind of led the way that, pe that paved the way for Chris. Um, to un to understand the in the intention of the school um, and where they wanted to go with this new technology in XR, um, and so what he ended up the result was they gave him they gave him a budget a good budget um, to open up a lab, and he has a lab now uh, with about sixteen like computers basically um, in the school, um, and this and these. Uh, students that he is i believe working working with are also special ed i believe um and so he is also uh has a purpose to help them as well so he did have a focus within the education segment like he had a, sp a specific goal a mission um kind of something i mentioned earlier um and that mission was very clear and it shows uh and he was able to prov provide results and also show that his his work from universe as a way to show that he is the subject subject matter expert of that school, um, and that really helped validate a lot of his thinking and him in the way that he approached this. Is that is that helpful? Yeah, I'll, yeah, no, I, I had to put the hand down, but yeah, no, yeah, okay, yeah. Chris is like <laughs> he's doing amazing. Yeah. That computer lab, he's he's got like yeah, sixteen computers with like their Alienware uh, desktops with thirty eighty graphics cards, so they're probably like about three thousand a piece. Um, so that lab to construct probably took between sixty to one hundred thousand um, dollars, and he must have got some sort of contract with the school to be able to do that. And I'm sure um, the work he did at Universe helped validate basically them putting the trust in him to give him those resources. Uh, so he's doing awesome stuff for sure. Yeah. Um, Okay, let's do some more questions for Adam, uh, and then we're gonna break out. So Adam, it's cool with you. I'll take. Let's do two more questions, and then we're gonna pour all over. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, sweet. Good. Let's go to. Um, let's go to Jur. Jur, are you there? Oh, and I want to take a question from live stream after this. Yeah. Yep. Okay, we'll go live stream after. Yeah, Jur, I can hear you. Okay. I just am um, curious if you're able to work from home or if you're required to go into the office a lot for your working out oh um yeah yeah so i i can the because i'm i'm in the uh, innovation group right um within walgreens so that is um a group that has no issue i can work globally so i i i can work from home essentially if that answers That's your awesome. question Awesome. Okay, I want to take a question from the live stream now. All right, so let me just kind of scan through. Um, yeah, I see Scott. Okay. Um, yeah, Scott, I'm passionate about um, 
let, let, yeah, let me just quickly answer this one. I'm passionate about helping people with mental illness and trauma VR. What companies can keep that eye out and, and the mental health VR space? Um, one of them is Trip. Um, Trip is an, uh, an app on the Oculus Quest. It also just recently acquired the Evolve VR community, which is like a meditation space. Um, and all spaces another community here. Um, so they've been doing a lot of activity within mental um, mental health and also just kind of like meditation. Um, so I would definitely look into them. Also get involved in the Evolve VR community here at Allspace. Um, they're very vibrant. They have a lot of free events and free meetups. Um, it's a really good community. Uh, one of the cool parts about being in the metaverse is that the same people you guys are going to be in class with are also going to be the same people that you can meet around the metaverse and other events as well. So unlike in Zoom where you know it's a Zoom call and then everyone parts ways and it's very unlikely you'll meet them surfing the digital internet, in Allspace, it's a very kind of close-knit community. So a lot of the people you'll see at other events on this Metaverse platform, you'll also see in class, which is makes it easier kind of to form a relationship and also kind of see where everyone's interests are. Um, so yeah, just like you would in real life, yeah. Okay, cool. So let's take another question from the live stream, this one more target. Let me see if I can find a good one. Um, Yes. And, and, and Adam, you said if uh, they're interested in connecting with you, uh, LinkedIn would probably be the best place for the note, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Because then, uh, and just say that you're, uh, you came from uh, universe, um, that way I'll, <laughs> I won't be like confused on who yeah. you are. So, um, yeah, it's really important. <laughs> um, if you, if, okay, you need, uh, if you need my last name, it's, uh, F A R O O Q. Yeah. 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 Yeah, now someone was actually asking about that. Okay, awesome. All right, let's do one more question. Actually, let's do because uh, Joshua's been raising his hand for a while. So let's go uh, French Leaf, then Joshua. And those will be the last questions. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so one thing I've been noticing is, and thank you for this again today. Um, you know, how do we make, are you noticing that there are, because you're on the inside, things coming in terms of making this more accessible for people um, who are, you know, uh, sight impaired, how, how are they going to come into this VR space? Are there things that are, I, I you know, it's just a concern of mine because it's like a whole faction of our population that's left out of this emergent space. And what are we going to do to, um, be able to a adapt, um, the space for people who are both hearing and visually impaired. And are you, do you have any kind of like inside intel about that in terms of your community about so, what's coming down the pipeline? So I'm under NDA. I cannot talk about what I'm working on. Um, and I, and, and that's just, you know, the business. Um, but I can say what is publicly available, uh, knowledge, and that is, um, Blind, the blind are being considered in this in the metaverse, um, and and the disabled are being are being focused on. Um, it's happening now, and it has been happening. Um, accessibility is a big piece of this, um, and we're seeing changes happen. You know, every every four to eight months. You know, uh, in terms of updates on the technology, um, what you'll find is a lot of uh, proof of concepts uh, available online uh, regarding the blind and the hearing impaired. Um, there's a lot of creative solutions out there, um, but but right now um, they're being like quote unquote like productized. Um, and so you 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 will see them, especially when these next the next iteration of the hardware comes out. And in, and I'm talking about like eye tracking. For example, and and things like that. When when these new this new hardware enables the software to capture that that data, and understand it, then you're going to see a lot more of that, uh, a, a lot more of that those solutions mature. Um, and so what you're what you're what you're going to ex experience is a fast growth in that area in particular, um, because of that because the foundation has been laid. Um, or like already, right? Um, and I'm thinking about like results, like in terms of uh, better outcomes for those for those disabled disabled people. And um, so they're not being left behind. Um, they're being they're being considered, um, and they're and considered with the utmost you know attention um, to their needs. Um, and feel free to reach out to me. 
on LinkedIn uh, to discuss more if you need if you need more clarity on some of these other things. Yeah. Awesome. All right, let's go. Last question to Joshua. Uh, Joshua, do you still have your question? Yeah, I do. Uh, it's a pretty quick one too. I just didn't know. Uh, I know we have the recording of this class, but are we going to have access to these slides maybe in the Google Classroom as well? Oh, uh, I, I have to ask with Adam. What do you think? Uh, I mean, uh, you, you can you can have access to whatever. I mean, I mean, I I, I would get Justin's permission too before yeah, you that's true. You're share, right, yeah. share anything. Yeah, let me get um, back but, to you on that then. Yeah, we have to ask Justin. I as mean, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to forget names or anything like that. Just kind of have all the information there. Yep. Right on. Okay. Awesome. All right. So uh, we're going to portal off into our next world. Uh, so everyone's welcome to come. You know, people you're coming with us regardless. Um, so I'm going to be stationed. We're actually going to have a few different people. Um, Adam will stay for as long as he can. Uh, he'll go off and portal, like go to another side of the room. Uh, I'm going to be there. So you can ask me questions about anything. Um, so just, yeah, come up to us, ask questions. You'll be able to see like a VR world. One of our uh, students made artsy. Um, you probably saw another what world of hers in the workshop. This is another one we're going to visit today. Um, so yeah, please come up, ask us any questions. Uh, we have other people, uh, Chris O, who's our instructor for the course as well, uh, is going to be there. So this is what he looks like. So you want to come on stage for a sec. Uh, so he's going to be there if you want to go up and ask him any questions. Um, so yeah, just so everyone knows who we are, this is Adam. This is, uh, I'm Nicholas, uh, and then this is Chris O. So uh, come up to whichever one you want, ask questions to, and we can help with anything. Um, and yeah, feel free to explore the world. So I'm gonna drop the portal here in the center. Um, the way this is gonna work, we do have over 30 people right now, so um, we're gonna have to drop multiple portals. Uh, so let me go ahead and get the first one going. Uh, so we're gonna click on the blue orb. One sec. And live stream people keep dropping your questions in the live chat. I'll be able to see them and monitor them as well. So I'm dropping the first portal here in one world. I'm gonna drop another portal here. Uh, so, and Chris, so do you actually wanna drop it? Cause you're on PC, it might be more stable if you drop it um, to, I'm not sure which world you're in, but in case the other one. Yeah, I will definitely do that. And hello yeah. everybody, how are you? And um, yeah, should be under my events. So if you don't get, I'm gonna stay, have another avatar stay behind just in case, but you'll also be able to find the event if you go to menu events and then go to all. So the all tab in the top left, you should see the breakout session uh, once we start getting some people in there. All right, so um, uh, you know, let me move the, turn off the stage blocker here. So once you have a line going from your um, avatar to the orb, do not click again. All right, do not click again. Also, if you send my avatar here a friend request, I'll be able to message you to get in as well. I'm gonna go ahead and make the event public. So if you, you'll also be able to find it on your menu system. All right, so let me go ahead and do that. Those for me, if you need uh, entrance into this breakout session, please friend me. Yep. All right, so hopefully everyone has been clicking on one orb. I'm going to be stay behind just in case we miss anybody. Um, yeah, I think go ahead and shoot over. And let's go ahead and jump in three, two, one. Okay. And I will be launching this. And I see a little. Yep, Chris, you want to jump over? Yep. You go three, ahead and launch it. Two, one. I gotta turn my volume. One sec. You're saying, Chris? Oh, there you go. What's up? What's up? Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. I will be launching the event here. Hello. Hi. Let me mute myself here. Okay. I mean, I'm.
segment or the first course. This is this is what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And let me just tell these uh, people in the other room. Guys, if you're in the other room and you haven't joined yet, go to menu. I'm going to support all these people. But go to menu, go to my, uh, events, all, and then you'll be able to find the breakout session there. You also have a front of plus second to join there. All right, let's go and jump in. Hello. Hello. Oh. All right. Um, okay, other questions, guys. Questions. Let's go to Walk. Uh, Welcome. Look, I was. Juan, do you have a question? I was getting ideas from people walking by. Yeah. I think I think this is one. Uh, Juan, you should just be able to talk. Okay. All right. I think I was muted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's say I want to take a class now, starting you know now, but yeah. I may not have time to continue the the next course, uh, you know, the following two months. Okay. Yeah. If I take that two month break, can I come back into the second okay. course on there. that? Third run, yeah. essentially. Nice yeah. To meet you. Yeah. Once you enroll, so if you enroll, once you enroll on any course, Hello. you can always retake any future run for free. Uh, so that allows you, like, if something does come up. Um, oh, we're getting a lot of conversation. Let's move a little bit more to the left over here. We don't overlap here. Hey guys, we're answering questions over here just because we're getting overlapping audio. Um, so if you have any questions, you can find me over here. Oh, can you hear me? Hello. No, I, yeah, I can hear you. Right. Say it again. What I'm yeah. saying is that, yeah, once you enroll in one course, it's free for you to take as many times as you like. So, yeah, it's completely doable. Um, and uh, just being on the pipeline, pretty much, let's say it takes me four years to complete all four courses. Huh? You'll be, you know, I'll be available. You'll be available four years from now, example, right? Yeah, I mean, hopefully, like I we, yeah. just hopefully we'll be I mean, more yeah. than available. Yeah, we have we have plans to expand and launch more courses. So yeah, hopefully we'll be more than available. Our our basically mission right now is to build what you didn't you demi has built in two D, but for live courses taught in the metaverse. Um, so right now we're gonna be launching a new Blender course in uh, early May. After Hello. that, we're going to be launching a mobile AR development it, course, it, then a design course for XR. After that, a day. cryptocurrency, then blockchain, then Ooh. NFT development courses. So those are the courses we name? have um, <laughs> we're planning on launching. Oh, yeah. Good good um, so yeah, good once it's free, it's free forever, yeah. The other benefit of that is that yeah. we constantly yeah. update our material. So in the industry, there's going to be new standards that are constantly being changed. So we'll make new content, new videos that you can always come back to yeah. later on. You have always access. You always have access to the new runs which have that updated content. Uh, let's see. If you click on me, what does it say? Uh, one sec. Let me go ahead and. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm just there's a lot of people talking about here. Uh, You're a developer? Like, I don't know anything um, about Can we just ask him? Hey guys, uh, could, uh, could you move a little yeah. bit behind us? Because, yeah, we're just getting some I'm trying to be audio over here. getting to it. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah. You're in the right sorry. place. Yeah. I'm more of a uh, computer, like a hardware guy. Could you, could you move a little bit back just because we're hearing some overlapping audio? I'm not used to. Um, programming anything. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Uh, let's take some questions from the live stream, though. Uh, let me take a question from the live stream first because they've been asking a few. How many months does it take to complete all the courses and get placed? So, uh, saw so someone jump. Yeah. Um, so, to complete all the courses, right now we have four courses in our VR development pipeline. Each course takes about nine to 10 weeks to complete with about a two week break. So, you should plan about 44 weeks to complete all four courses. But you know, it doesn't mean you have to get 44 weeks in order to get placed. For example, Justin got placed uh, after he completed the second course, and so did Adam. So, you're supposed to be recruiting and networking as you go through the courses. So it's not like, oh, okay, now I've finished all the courses, now I can start going to the job market. Obviously, you're gonna be more prepared, but by the end of the second courses, you already have a portfolio of seven uh, to 10 metaverse metaverse worlds that you could show off. So yeah, you should be networking and recruiting throughout. Um, the other thing I wanna say with, yeah, the reason why our courses, so if you look at another a typical uh, program, they will usually say that, you know, you can learn basically from scratch to building a VR app in a 10 week period. Uh, but the issue with that is we've seen they move way too fast. So a lot of times if, if you have someone that doesn't come with a lot of experience, you know, they're not a software engineer of, you know, multiple years, they're not going to really be able to digest the content or even have time to do personal projects or modifications. So that's why we've 
um, leveled off our courses so it's over a longer period of time um, to allow you more time to experiment and really digest the content instead of trying to cram it um, in a very short time span. And even with that time span, you know, our courses right now cost 499 on average with the full pipeline that costs 249. If you look at an equivalent live VR development program like taught in Zoom, those courses cost, cost between four to $12,000. Um, so which is why we're going to be doubling the prices next run and why I say you should get in right now while the prices are basically like ridiculously below market value. Another thing is we have about like 70 to 120 students. We're probably gonna be welcoming in this run. Their class sizes are usually, you know, 14 to 20. Um, and that's because we want to make it more democratic and more accessible uh, for people to be able to access this type of education. Yeah. Um, other questions. Yeah. Let's go to, um, go to supervisor and then we'll go to juror. Uh, supervisor, uh, you can unmute. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, no, I was wondering, uh, I was meaning to call, uh, get in contact with you even before and, um, but I was hoping if I can get into a private call with you at some point, preferably today, yeah, you, I don't know if you have time. Uh, if you follow, so right now on in the class, but if you follow up after on our website, on our chat, I uh, should be available to help. So if you go to our website, try yours.com on the bottom right, there's a chat bot, drop your message there and then we can talk over there. Okay. Sounds good. I already had got an email from you, I guess, but, um, yes, I've seen where the chat is. So I'll reach out to you. Yeah. yeah so that, if anyone has questions afterwards, obviously right now I'm, I'm here, but when the session ends, if you have follow-up questions, you want to ask me individually. Go to our website, tryuniverse.com. There's a chat bot in the bottom right, and I can help answer your questions um, much more quickly than email. Um, yeah, you can also email us by going to the contact us. That's another option on our site. Um, other questions? Oh, Jur, yeah. Jur had his hand up first. Yeah, let's go to Jur. Hey, how's it going? Um, I was wondering that um, at the start of the course, um, they had mentioned that there would be or th that they might have a discount code. At the, we would wait till the end to, for you guys to tell us. The, are you talking about when we were at the workshop? Yeah. Yeah. So the workshop, if you attended a workshop, we gave out a discount code at the workshop. Um, so yeah, it, we can't give out the discount code now because that was for the students that attended the workshop. But if you did attend the workshop, there is a recording you can watch and in the recording, we give you the discount code. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, other questions? Uh, let's go to Dapper and then we'll go to Juan again. Uh, and actually, yeah, after Dapper, we'll take a, we'll ask a question and then we'll go to Juan. Let's go to Dapper first. Hey, Dapper. Hi, Nick. I've, I've actually signed up for the, the uh, full pipeline course. I'm just wondering how you huh? connect to the Discord channel. Yes. Yeah, so if you go to the Google Classroom, uh, there should be an assignment, I think, under week one. Uh, and then there it gives you the link to join the discord and also the instructions on how to use it. We're going to be going over the discord more in depth in our next class Saturday. Um, but you should be able to join it by going to the Google classroom under the week one, uh, topics. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. And there's also, yeah. Uh, if, if any time there's any problems with anything and you're not on the discord, discord is the first place you usually get help with things, but message me on the website and I can walk you through anything. Uh, so we take one question from the live stream and then I'll go back to uh, Juan. Uh, so T God asks, can I use an SSD Windows 10 boot up for the class? Um, so first question I have is, is this an external SSD? Um, if it's just an SSD you have inside your computer, um, that's more than fine. SSDs are actually preferable to HDDs. Uh, we actually have, we have a guide in the Google Classroom on basically breaking those down and choosing a computer for VR development. But yeah, Windows 10, uh, that's more than fine as an operating system. Mac also works, Linux works. The only operating systems that don't work are Chrome OS, so no Chromebooks. And you can't run a tablet um, or phone to run Unity, so it has to be a computer. Um, what else did I wanna say there? Oh yeah, so just general stuff on computer, it's a common question we get. Um, so for our first two classes, uh, yeah, for our first class, sorry, I should say, our recommendations for a computer is to have a computer with at least six gigabytes of RAM, an Intel i3 or equivalent or higher processor, and then 120 gigabytes of storage. So that's for the first course. And that really means any basic Windows or Mac computer within the last no, five no, of years course. work. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, any basic Windows or Mac computer within the last five
five years should work. Uh, but when you go to the second course, that's where we recommend having a little bit better computer with eight gigabytes of RAM, uh, an Intel i5 or equivalent processor, um, and 256 gigabytes of storage. Um, yeah, and we go through a guide basically breaking down um, more of the questions you might have, like GPU versus CPU. Uh, if you want to use the Oculus Link cable, what recommendations do you have? Um, stuff like that. I'm getting a little bit of feedback from you. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, Par uh, Parable, if you could just um, unmute, just because we're hearing some feedback from around you, that'd be great. Um, yeah. Uh, let's go. Um, still hearing some feedback. Okay, cool. There we go. Oh, um, uh, Parable, could you mute? Just here. Okay, thank you. All right, sweet. Yeah. All right, all good. Okay. Um, yeah. So just yeah, computer. Check out the guide. It's on our Google Classroom again. Everyone should have been emailed that. Um, just right now, an email should have gone out, I believe. Or, yeah, I think so. We'll be inviting you either today or tomorrow to the Google Classroom. You could also join it by going to the website tryingnumbers.com. Go to the courses tab, click on intro to Unity. There's a join Google Classroom button in the top right. As long as you have a Gmail, so an email that ends in at Gmail, you can join it. Uh, other emails you might have some issues with. It's not always, but sometimes it does cause issues. Um, and there's a guide under Classwork, Computer for VR Development, which basically breaks down everything I'm talking about. I can go more in depth if you do have questions. Let's go to Juan, because I know he's been raising his hand for quite some time. Uh, no, just one last question. How long before, you know, how many weeks into the courses before you're able to create something like this, you know, so like a full space like this? That's second. So you build your first all space world in the first week of the second course. But, you know, you build that's a very basic world in the first week of the second course. As you go through the course, you learn more complex things that help build more intricate worlds. So in the first week, you go over how to, you know, get a basic. Uh, world going in alt space and then the second week you learn how to use third-party asset stores like sketchfab and the unity asset stores to populate them with you know more uh, extravagant assets in the third week you go over version control so you can get in github to back up your projects in the fourth week you go over blender decimation to optimize your assets and increase performance for your users after that you go over unity lighting and how to do big lighting which is also a performance thing uh, after that we go over advanced animations uh, for unity and how to get them into alt space go over alt space kit building and we have a bunch of optional material for those that want to go further into alt space development like mixed reality the mre or mixed reality extensions toolkit uh for alt space we go over uh, how to make 360 photospheres and hemispheres a photogrammetry workshop so there's a bunch of other stuff um uh damer i'm hearing some background now if you could just mute or do you have a question no okay. no i don't uh, yeah. have any question okay Sorry. all good all good no worries um Let's see, I see uh, Adieu has a question. Yeah, hi. Uh, would you say that this course is more directed towards like um, game development and world development or um, is it also like including like apps or like, like yeah. software? So, well, yeah, so basically it depends. If you're building like a web app, you know, if you're building like some sort of internet app that's gonna be on two dimensions or you're building like um, maybe a 2D mobile phone app, like kind of like an Uber kind of app uh, or an Instagram or social media platform app. There you'd want to go with more traditional development. You know, you'd want to use Android Studios um, but or like Swift for iOS. Uh, but if you're looking to build spatial apps, so, you know, three-dimensional applications, that could be any type of XR application. If you're looking to build any type of games for mobile, console, um, Windows. Um, so any type of spatial application, you know, you're building for the metaverse. You're going to 100% need a game engine. Um, Unity is by far the dominant engine for um, spatial development. So 60, 66% of all VR games are made with you using Unity. 91% of all augmented reality games are made using Unity. And basically every major metaverse platform, Decentraland, the Sandbox, Rec Room, VR Chat, Altspace, and even Horizon's own uh, world, uh, Horizon Worlds, or Meta's own Horizon Worlds, those are all made with the Unity engine, which is basically like a really good signal to kind of the widespread use and power of Unity. So if you're looking to get into spatial computing and spatial development, um, you know, XRAR, then of course Unity is definitely gonna be the engine that I recommend. Obviously I'm biased, but uh, we've seen it in terms of popularity and community and um, SDKs that it supports. It's the most powerful in our opinion, or at least best use case. Um, but if you wanna make web apps um, or like, you know, phone 2D apps, then I would look to elsewhere for like traditional development. 
Unity is also very dominant for mobile games. 50% of all mobile games are made with Unity, and that's actually where its bread and butter market are. But if you're here in alt space and you're exploring the metaverse, I'm assuming that you guys are interested in developing for this. So for those cases, anything spatial, uh, three-dimensional, Unity is definitely uh, what I'd recommend. Uh, other questions, live stream people, do you have questions? I'm still looking at the live chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, questions from all space. Anyone have questions for me? Questions? Let's see. Are we all good? Give me an emoji if you have a question so I can call on you. Or, are we where good? Where I can get the course, guys? Like, where I can find the course? What? Where can you where find Where I course? can find the course? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, I, uh, I'll send you a friend request and send you a link. Uh, but basically, if you go to tryuniverse.com, so that's T-R-Y-U-N-I-V-E-R-S-E.com, uh, there is the courses page. This course, we recommend starting with the Introduction to Unity and c -sharp Programming course, which is basically our beginner know course. I already stuff. Yeah. I just want to yeah, know. No, we we, it, we yeah. teach you. Yeah. We teach you that. Yeah. So you don't have to have any previous experience coming into it. That, that course teaches you. Unity development, C sharp programming, and the Unity 3D, li 3D library. So you'll learn how to do uh, gameplay mechanics, uh, UI design, sound design, um, uh, sound effects, uh, particle effects, animations, um, and you're basically you have a really solid foundation that you'll build on in the later courses where we go into metaverse world development, VR app development, and VR app publishing. Okay, I just see you friended me. So I'm gonna send you the link right now. Yeah. Okay. I add you. I'll send you a link. Um, uh, I think I uh, paste. There we go. Sent. Okay. Uh, another thing, Thanks. And Thanks. I mentioned yeah, this. The link. No problem. Yeah. Um, another thing we get asked about a ton is people are like, what, what if I want to learn a specific metaverse platform development? I mentioned this in the workshop, so some of you might have heard this before. Um, oh, Sergi, before I go into that, Sergi's asking, do we create any games in the first course? Yes. Do you create a game every single week? Uh, you have the option to create two games. We basically have a weekly project and a challenge. The challenge is optional. So you're required to create one project a week, um, one game a week. Um, you have an optional project for the second that's more of a challenge to boost your grade. Um, so by the end of the course, you'll have between seven to 14 projects, and you also have the option of doing a personal project. Um, so yeah, you're doing that every single week. So you'll have a portfolio of projects by the end of the course, and, and by the end of each course, you'll in the next course you're building, um, seven wor uh, metaverse worlds in the third course you're going to build a VR app and then in the fourth course you publish it to the Oculus app lab store all right um what did I want to say uh, I was talking about metaverse development yeah so as I said every major metaverse platform is basically made with unity now these metaverse platforms what they do some of them is basically they give native world building tools so they make world building tools that are in app and that's the only way creators can create content for these metaverse platforms the issue with that is that, oh, excuse me, is that you can only build those worlds in that specific metaverse platform. So if you want to build that same you know, world you made and port it to another metaverse platform, you're not able to. And you're basically chained to that metaverse platform in terms of the users you can reach and the content you can distribute. So if that metaverse platform, for whatever reason, doesn't have the growth you want or it actually dies, which is not uncommon for metaverse platforms, all those skills are not going to be transferable and neither is your content if you need to move to a new metaverse platform. So that's why we teach Unity, where you can build the content in one central engine, and Unity will handle the deployment to multiple different platforms. So you can have this same world, you know, the world we're seeing right now, you can deploy it to Altspace, which is obviously a metaverse platform, VRChat, which is a metaverse, another metaverse platform. You could deploy it for a console game, a independent uh, VR game, AR game, or AR app, doesn't have to be a game, mobile, you could build, you can use the same assets and distribute it across multiple platforms instead of basically being pitched to one. Um, so that's why we teach Unity and not a metaverse platform specifically because the skills are way more applicable. If you ever wanna work for a company, a metaverse company even, you're gonna need extensive Unity knowledge. Okay, um, other questions? I'm, not gonna, I'm losing my voice a bit, so I can't take too many more. Um, Hello. Questions for me? Oh. <laughs> Where is that coming from? Do I do? How do I raise my hand? Oh, I see you. Yeah. Hey, Peggy. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just um, purchased a book on C-sharp. 
that I'm because uh -huh. I don't know it at all. Um, yeah, no worries. Should I start learning that now, or should I wait for you to present some material that we can go for? It hmm. Yeah. So that's that, yeah. You could 100 have optional material like the book that could be a great resource. Um, hmm. I would say there's no harm in starting it now. Um, I don't think they're going to. They're obviously not going to teach anything contradictory to what we're doing. Um, you might get a little bit discouraged because I personally don't think the book is as engaging as, you know, what we do with live classes and, um, but so I would say start it. And then if you start feeling discouraged, take a break, go through our correct classes, and then maybe give it another try. I would really use it as a supplemental material. We also have a documentation guide on our Google classroom going over C sharp program with a lot of the terminology defined and examples. Um, and later we're going to be posting some tutorials by unity on beginner and inter intermediate C sharp programming. <clears throat> which a lot of students find okay. helpful. So I would say try it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, use it as a supplemental resource now. Okay, because I know in the Unity link, you gave us a link to beginner scripting. Uh -huh. Yeah. Is that C Sharp? Yes, yes, exactly. It was, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's another good Great, resource. Thank yeah. you. No problem. Um, do you have any course for integration in Metaverse and NFT blockchain? Um, again, we don't have a course on blockchain and NFT development yet. Um, that's one of the courses we're building. The pipeline for us is the Blender course is the first one we're releasing, which is 3D modeling, which teaches you how to model your own 3D assets. Uh, that one's coming out early May. And then the next course after that is going to be mobile AR development, probably a shorter course. Uh, and then after that, it's going to be designed for XR. And then we'll go into blockchain, um, cryptocurrency, and NFT development. So. Uh, that's a bit later in the pipeline of what we're launching, um, so we don't have it available now. Uh, but the students that are in our community will always get access to the first runs of our courses, which are always going to be discounted. So you'll get access to the basically the um, kind of launches for all the new courses we do, which will have lower rates, uh, yeah, compared to what we're eventually moved towards. Um, other questions for me? Questions on live stream? Feel free to ask them as well. Uh, questions for me? Hello. Uh, hi. I'm hi. over here. Oh, hello. Jody. Hi. hi How Jody. are you? Hi. So, hey, Jody. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I just no. got kicked off of my Oculus. I lost my battery, so I'm back on a computer. Um, oh, okay. I, I was looking into maybe creating an app or like designing furniture or something like kind of for oh. the metaverse. But I want to definitely yeah. do an app. Is that something that I'll be able to do through this course as far as like yeah. making different furniture, that sort of stuff? And like, is that something okay, I can so, possibly complete with this course or is that something different? Yes. Uh, yeah. So definitely. It's, so for sure, but this is, that I'll make one key point. So basically um, if you're making application, what you're going to learn from us is really a lot on the development side. So if you want to do like the UI, if you want to do, if you have any sound effects, if you want to program the interactions, like what happens when the user clicks this button in or how does he actually place them? Like, is there some sort of like hologram that shows where it's going to be before they place their furniture? Um, so any type of interaction, any type of sound design, UI, that's what we're going to help with. Uh, we'll also teach you how to basically get assets from asset stores like Sketchfab and Unity, Unity Asset Store. Now, if you want okay. to build those furniture assets yourself, you know, model them, um, that is what we're going to be doing in the Blender course, which we're launching in early May. And we are, we do go over Blender in the second course briefly, basically teaching you how to get assets from Unity to Blender, use some basic Blender operations, and then decimate those assets, which lowers their poly count and makes them more performant. Um, so yeah, in terms of actual app development, yes, that's that's what we do. If it's an XR app, if it's a spatial app, Unity skills are gonna be essential for that. Um, in terms okay. of creating models, that's what we're doing in our Blender course, which we're launching in early May. Okay, perfect, thank you so much. Okay. No problem, yeah? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, Eric, yeah, Eric, the, the raffle had passed. Uh, we announced the winner about 40 minutes ago. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, other questions for me? Hey, Scat Cats. How's it going? Scat Cats was the, I think it was the last, Hello. Yeah, last workshop's winner, yeah. Yeah. Um, any questions for me, guys? Questions? So this is a world by Artsy. She's one of our past students. Um, so this is a good example. She's basically a professional world builder now. Um, so she builds worlds. She basically builds templates. And you might have heard of this from when I mentioned this in the workshop, but she builds templates, which is like these worlds here. And then she could sell these templates to enterprise and consumer customers, which can use them for a variety of events and 
different functions. So, you know, we're using them as a breakout session. She's also built like club worlds for events. We use them for work meetings. And then she could have this asset, you know, this world she built in Unity and then distribute it across multiple platforms. So she could bring the same world into, you know, met another metaverse platform into another um, type of app itself. Like, you know, if you wanted to be, make this be like a console world uh, or like a PC world, you could do that. Um, now, RT came into our class without any previous Unity or programming experience and made a career out of it and is one of the more like prolific people uh, in this metaverse community. Um, Nero is another one who's amazing. She came in with some Unity background without any programming background, and she's like super prolific in all space. Um, she was working with the Burning Man uh, in VR festival that took place here. Um, Artsy, so Artsy, so like, again, we teach you how to get assets, assets from asset stores in the second course. Artsy um, went the extra leg up and actually builds all her assets from the ground up with Blender. So everything you see here, she models herself. Other questions for me? All right. I think we're all on the same page. Uh, my voice is about to give out. I highly encourage you guys to explore the world around you. Um, this Tuesday night is the deadline in order to enroll in the course. If you do not enroll in the course by then, you won't be gained access to the rest of the nine, the rest of the ten week course. And again, we will be doubling our prices for the run after. So I definitely recommend enrolling in this run. Um, the, if you do, if you are confident that you want to get the full pipeline and you want to, you know, go through and develop your own uh, VR and AR apps, the full pipeline package is definitely going to save you um, quite a bit of money. So fifty percent off, saves you a thousand bucks. Um, that's on our website under courses. Um, yeah. And once you take our courses once, it's free forever. You can retake it as many times as you like. Okay, guys. I hope to see you guys next Saturday uh, for our next class. Um, message me on the website, com. Drop chats. Uh, my voice is giving out, but my hands can still type. Uh, and I hope to see you guys with us in the metaverse. Okay. All right. Safe travels, guys. See ya. Hey, he just abandoned us. Hey. Hey. <laughs> How are you? Yeah. How you doing? How are you? It's a long day. I yeah. know. What y'all doing? Pretty good. How are you? Okay. Ooh, I was asking some kind fun. of room. Okay. Deal, I was right? sending you a, a friend request to uh, tell you that our congratulations okay. and that I won right. the raffle last night. So I'll see you in class. Awesome. Oh, Thank you. I just excited. Awesome. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> I know, yeah, me too. That's really good. That's just a great opportunity. Right? Uh -huh. You could take Absolutely. it, take the free classes as, as often as you want to, you said, huh? Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Refresher. Mm hmm Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, hi. Oh, hi, Kaya. <laughs> yeah, hi, you're Ellie. the one that won. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> I know. Oh, did I reject? Did I do something wrong, Kaya? Yeah, she just confronted me. She sent my message. Oh my God, what did I do? No, I, I we're friends. I mean, yeah, I think he on also. Um, all right. Sure. Because You're good, Steve. Hello. How are you? Are you? <laughs> I'm just learning my way around. <laughs> oh yeah. So how how long have uh, you so we're gonna get together, build a nation. <laughs> well, you know, that's one of the <laughs> that's one of the things that um that he said is, you know, people meet here and then they form families. I don't know if you guys have noticed some groups they have names and then they have the flock the chosen or, family. Yeah. yeah, the chosen family, yeah. And so that's yeah. kind of how those start. Because okay. I think you have a group project that we okay. work on in the class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they put yeah. like three people together. But mm -hmm. that's later on down the line, right? Where you right, build the right. uh, app together. Right. They had a, right. They had a guy, he, he did okay. something. You ever heard of Mad Coffee? Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah, I know who Mad Coffee is. Do you know who Mad right. Coffee is? Yeah. I, I yeah, saw the okay. talk show. And mm -hmm. actually, uh, I went to World, and it's, it's like dark like, and then it's coffee, and it got pictures of it. It's very nice, you know. Oh, yeah, really? I know it's very um, yeah. I gotta yeah. check yeah, it out. I mean, he sells coffee. Huh? Yeah, Optic made that <laughs> world. It's it's actually one of my favorite. Do you guys want to hop to it? Yeah. Sure. sure. Oh, to make okay. coffee? Sure. Yeah.
Yeah. Okay, let me open see your, how open you find your that. Java portal. Yeah, I got a, I got a lot of favorites. So you guys give me a minute. <laughs> oh, okay, so that's so cool. Yeah. But yeah, you Optic know. made that for him. And if you've oh, you been did? to any of, no, Optic made it. Okay. Do you know? Do you know Optic? Or have you no. seen any? Cause you've probably, you've probably seen some of his worlds. But if you guys want to see one, I have a couple of them. Yeah. He shared a couple of them with me. Um, you know who made you shake the, the sports ball shake? You, you saw that one? Yeah, I've seen that one, but I don't know who made that one. Do you? Mm -mm. Well, you know what? I, I noticed something though. I noticed that the worlds are more better or more graphic than this, and 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 